Shalom, shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Welcome back. Welcome back. I hope everyone's doing well. Shalom, shalom again. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right. So as you can tell by the title today, um, who are the ancient West and these Africans is what we'll be getting into today. Um, basically, today we'll be using a few book um, references and also genetic articles and studies to answer this question on who the ancient East and also West Africans would be, um, what um, lineage they would come from, and possibly what son of Noah they would come from, all right? So that's what we're going to be getting into today and trying to answer, um, because this basically stemmed from a conversation I had on, on, on the internet with a brother. Um, basically making claims, shalom family, shalom, basically making claims that, um, I guess you can say E1B1A is, um, Canaan, haplogroup B is Kush, um, E1B1B is Put, and, um, things of that sort, and I was just trying to explain to the brother, you know, that's not how, you know, haplogroups work, um, you know, so I'm just here to break down who those people would be basically. And I'm going to also be sh showing who the ancient West Africans would be um, according to information um, that we have, because a lot of people, again, they believe the Bantus or E1B1A has been in West Africa forever. So again, I'm going to be trying to answer two questions today. All right. All right. Uh, okay. When I get done wrapping this up, or when I get done going through the presentation, I'll drop the link in the um, chat for anyone who wants to come up. And um, you can share that, my brother. Of course, you can share that. So feel free to come up and share that if you want. So give me a second, share my screen, and um, we'll get into the information. All right. Again, we have to show this information, bring clarity on who the um, ancient peoples of West Africa would be you know, prior to the coming of these E lineages um, to sum up, to sum up everything. So again, let me get, go ahead and try to get this presentation pulled up and we'll get into this information. Got some good information coming today. All right. So let's see if we're ready. All right. Let's see if it's up. Okay, so we good. So again, who are the ancient West and East Africans is what we'll be getting into today. And to start off, we'll be looking into this genetic study right here. Um, it's called Genetic Patterns of Y Chromosome and Mitochondrial DNA Variation with Implications to the People of the Sudan. Um, I felt like going into this specific um, page of this source starting off would be pretty good for us to do. Um, it says specifically, um, and okay, before I get started as well, we'll be looking into again haplo groups and things of that sort today, as well as book material on these certain tribes. So starting off, it says that haplo group A and B are entirely restricted to African populations, while the rest of the haplo groups are present outside of Africa. The pattern or this pattern supports the hypothesis of an African origins of the human in YR and diversity. Haplogroups A is closest to the root of the tree and is found most frequently in Khoisan and Nilotic groups. And these are two of the groups we'll be talking about um, concerning East, ancient East and West Africans. Um, also, haplogroup A will be considered that as well. Um, haplogroup B chromosomes are most frequently observed among pygmies in Central Africa with B2A and B2B being early, excuse me, being nearly exclusive to this group. All right. So we see that these two specific haplotypes are, you know, exclusively amongst these pygmy peoples in Central Africa, as well as haplogroup E is overwhelmingly the most common haplogroup in Africa. And by the time we get done with this presentation, we will have an understanding on why haplogroup E is overwhelmingly the most common haplogroup in Africa, be it North Africa, East Africa, or even West Africa. So continuing on. So before we get started, we're going to go ahead and get into another overview of the chromosomes or Y haplogroups in Africa. And to do that, we're going to go to an unbiased resource 
of novel S&P markers provides a new chronology for the human Y chromosome and reveals a deep phylogenetic structure in Africa. And we're going to start at the highlighted, of course. And it says, in the time frame between 80, 85,000 or 85.5,000 to 75.7 thousand years ago, four splits were observed within the phylogenetic tree, um, basically. And before I even get started with reading, I forgot to summarize that this paper is basically revealing um, deep phylogenetic structure of Y chromosomes within Africa. Um, this is going to show the most ancient Y chromosomes within Africa, just setting the stage before we get into the ancient West in East Africans. So it says in the time frame between 85.5 and 75.7 thousand years ago, four splits were observed. The node within haplogroup A3B would separate southern A3B1 from eastern A3B2 African lineages. The node within haplogroup B2 separating clades B2A and B2B, which are frequently observed amongst present-day African food producers and hunter-gatherers, respectively. And three, two nodes that are highly informative from the exit of out of Africa that are basal to E through F and C through F respectively. So haplogroups like haplogroup E would be a haplogroup that's considered um, an out of Africa haplogroup, but we know that haplogroup E later back migrated. Um, it says in fact, haplogroup E has representatives both within and out of Africa, whereas haplogroup C through F encompasses chromosome found virtually outside or only outside of Africa. We use two discrete follow ge geographic analysis to associate each node of the tree to each of the four broad geographical regions encompassed on sub-Saharan Africa. First, we use a Banish analysis in which when starting with an even prior, the prosperity, or excuse me, the posterior probability favored a central Western African placement for the four present deep nodes of the tree. It says Southern and Eastern African locations were favored for the nodes defining haplogroups A3B and A3B2. So keep that in mind. The emergence of new divergent or diver diversity out of Africa was captured in an analysis by a shift in a location assignment along the branch leading to EF with all nodes downstream assigned to non-Sub-Saharan African locations with high confidence. So again, haplogroup E would not be a quote-unquote sub-Saharan African lineage. But again, haplogroups B and A would be, as it said. So continuing on, it says, the first two splits in our tree dated to around 196,000 years ago and 167,000 years ago separate branches that are currently found at low frequencies in Central Western Africa, which specifically is A1B and A1A. It goes on to say, but have not been detected elsewhere in the African continent. This geographical confinement of deep lineages is at odds with the mainly Eastern African position of sites providing fossils of comparable ages. It says the question then becomes, when did these lineages um, reach Central Western Africa? Two hypotheses can be put forward. One, ancient residents of A1B and A1A in Eastern Africa, followed by relocating to Central Africa, an extinction in the mount, or excuse me, in the motherland or Eastern Africa, possibly together with another yet unknown, deeply rooted branch. Or two, ancient residents of A1B and A1A in Central Western Africa with lost fossil records there. The finding of the oldest lineage record so far, A00, within Cameroon, as our or as to our follow geographic results in suggesting. Central Western Africa as a broad region populated by deep MYS, excuse me, MSY lineages earlier than 1, 160,000 years ago. All right. So we're seeing haplogroup A as well within Central Africa and even in West Africa. It goes on to say that our data set places the TMRCA or the most recent common ancestor of haplogroup B to around 110,000 years ago, a date that is unexpectedly odd if one considers the pre the previous length of this branch. And shalom, shalom to everyone in the chat. Um, it says the current distribution of chromosomes and dating of the two B subclades also testify to early dispersals following by partial isolation 
in particular haplogroup B2A, M150, which has been associated with the expansion of Bantu speakers and dated at 6,000 years ago on the basis of its STR diversity turned out to be a very ancient lineage, long predating the alleged timing of the Bantu expansion. So you see right here that you have a quote-unquote native African lineage being associated with the Bantu expansion. Uh, but it goes on to say right here, beyond the dis um, disparity of the microsatellite and SMP divergent ages, these data or this data indicate that only a small subset of the overall B2A diversity became incorporated into the male gene pool of the Bantu speakers. So during the Bantu migration, these native African populations such as B2A was actually incorporated into the population of Bantu speakers. It says, as for B2B, it is reported that South African Khoisan or Khoi Khoi speakers harbor a highly divergent subset of these chromosomes, all right? So we're starting to map out what people have these specific chromosomes, and we're going to link them to these ancient West and East Africans, and in turn link them to Sons of Ham. So right here is um, it's a chart from this paper we was just reading, and it actually shows these lineages that encompasses um, Africa, and particularly the beginning or the onslaught of Africa, the ancient lineages within Africa. So for example, if we was to look right here in the green, in the far right within East Africa, and correspond that to the tree over here that we see, or the phylogenetic tree that we see over here, the ancient lineages within East Africa would be A3B, for example, all right? Um, if we was to take it to Western Africa and look over here in the, the light blue, the ancient lineages within West Africa would be haplotypes like B1. And even within Cameroon, we see haplogroup or haplogroups A1B and things like that. And even up here in the Western Sahel towards Morocco and Mauritania, we see A1B1, or excuse me, A1B. And even in North Africa, we see A as well. Southern Africa, we will see haplogroups A, um, haplogroups A through A B and A three B one. All right. So the reason we don't see haplogroup E anywhere on this ancient map of haplogroup distribution in Africa is because um, it's not really native to Africa. It came in at a later time, which we will um, get to throughout this presentation. So, continuing on, Genesis ten reads: the sons of Ham were Cush. Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. So I think it's safe to say that the sons of Ham would have haplotypes A and B based off the information that I've brought out thus far. But what I would do is to continue to expound on this information and prove it even more. To do that, we're going to start off by looking at the kingdom of Cush. All right. We're going to look at the kingdom of Cush to start off. And give me one second, actually, while I make my screen full screen. I want you all to be able to see this the right way. So I'm going to make this full screen. All right. So like I was saying, we will be starting off in the kingdom of Kush to um, show those ancient East African lineages and show what people they will be related to. Um, are they related to present day, you know, um, I guess you could say E1, B1, B lineages, like people say, because even I've heard people say things like, well, the, the, um, the most frequent or the, the, mo the majority of the haplogroups in East Africa is E1, B1, B. A lot of Ethiopians have E1, B1, B. Therefore, the sons of Kush will be E1, B1, B. Um, I reject that. And right here, I'm going to actually show you, you know, how to determine those haplotypes of those sons. Again, we're starting off with the kingdom of Kush. And to do that, we're going to go to um, Historical Dictionary of Ancient and Medieval Nubia, right here, where it says Kush. It says, this is the name for the region and kingdom centered in Nubia. So this world we'll be focusing on, modern-day Nubia, will be the ancient territories of Kush, ancient, of the ancient son of Kush mentioned in Genesis 10. The terms Kush and Kerma are particularly difficult to extract from each other. This dictionary refers to Kerma from the period from about 
2500 BC to 1500 BC and Kush from the time thereafter until the end of Moreau in the 4th century CE. On the one hand, the Nubian people of Kermer were especially, or excuse me, were essentially the subordinate po political ancestors of the colonial Kush, as well as later independent Kush or Napata. So let's continue on. So again, the ancient Nubia would be, or excuse me, the ancient Kush would be in Nubia. This is also the land or the ancient land referred to as Ethiopia. This would be the territories of Nubia or Sudan. So continuing on to this book right here, it's named The Sons of God and the Daughters of Man, an Afro-Asiatic Interpretation of Genesis 1 through 11. Starting on page six, we will start right here where it says Nimrod was not a son of Semite, or excuse me, was not a Semite nor a Yaphite. The sons of Ham were Cush, and the two lands of Egypt and Put and Canaan, and Cush gave birth to Nimrod. Nimrod then was a descendant of Ham. His father's land was Cush, present-day northern Sudan. We know that the Yehudim, or the Jews, who were relating this mythology did not bless Ham and his descendants. In fact, they were attributed to a divine curse that would then, or excuse me, that they would be slaves of slaves. But they were aware that these Hamites had in times past produced great men. Nimrod, also known in Yoruba language as Lamarud, the first Gibrier or Gabor, also in Yoruba, Al-Gabar means professor or power, was a Kushite. And Kush was in that part of Africa, now occupied by the Republic of Sudan. All right. So again, ancient Kush is in Sudan or Nubia. And these people would be the Dinka and the Shaluku or the, or the Nilotic Sudanese that are a part of the tallest people in the world. Isaiah knew of them. Now, before I continue, I just want to point out something real quick that's showing a little connection between the Yoruba dialect and the Hebrew dialect. Um, for example, right here, where it says um, the first Gabor, which means um, ruler or king or power, um, right here. This is actually a Hebrew word for Gabor, which means king or power. Um, same thing in Yoruba language, uh, possessor of power. So we see the similarity in, in the Yoruba language. It's named al Agabara, but in Hebrew it's Gabor, al Gabara. And Gabor mean means the same thing um, in Yoruba language and Hebrew. But that's just something I just want to throw out. But it goes on to say that Isaiah knew of them. And by of them, they mean Isaiah knew of the Dinka and the Shaluk, which is interesting. It says, ah, land of whirling winds, which is beyond the rivers of Cush, which send ambassadors by the Nile and vessels of papyrus upon the waters. Go ye shift messengers to a nation tall and smooth. To a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land the waters divide. The description is repeated in verse 7. In that time, or at that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a tall and smooth people. Excuse me, um, excuse me, from a small and smooth people, from a people feared and near and far, a nation mighty and conquered, whose lands the waters divided. These people, tall and smooth, who live beyond the rivers of Cush, are the Shaluk and the Dinka. And we know that these two peoples or these two tribes are what we would call Nilotic tribes or Nilo Saharan tribes. Um, it goes on to say to the 19th and even to the mid 20th century, travelers, the Dinka were better known as giants about seven feet tall, who, like the Nile cranes, stand on one foot in a river for hours looking for fish. All right. So again, that verse that we were just reading in Isaiah is really, um, or literally linking these um, features of these Nilotic or these Nubian tribes or these Kushite tribes that Isaiah was speaking about to the Shaluk and to the Dinka. But we're going to continue to expound on that. It's also another tribe that we can look at within the territories of Kush or ancient Kush and Nubia who are possibly descendants of Kush as well. And those people are known as the Nuba. Um, so you have the Dinka, you have the Shaluk, and you have the Nuba or the Nubia people. 
It says the most populous of non-Arab group in the Sudan, north of the Sud, is a dark-skinned group known as the Nuba. These people whose interests or whose interesting way of life and strikingly tall and dignifying bearing have been the subject of many documentaries are said to be descendants of the people from the kingdom of Kush. Kush thrived along the Nile in Sudan more than 3,000 years ago when Egypt to the north was ruled by the pharaohs. For thousands of years, the Nuba occupied much of the center of Sudan. When the Arab tribes came to the Sudan, however, they pushed the Nuba into the mountains, which are known today as the Nuba Mountains. All right. So, again, these people are known to be descendants of the people of Kush um, from the territories of Nubia, and even their name reflects it. So let's continue to build upon that as well. So again, we have the Nuba, we have the um, the Dinka and the Shaluk in the territories, or who are or who would be considered descendants of Kush. All right, and we have their Y DNA right here. We see, for example, the Dinka have high proportions of haplo haplo group A, sixty two percent, and even haplo group B at twenty three. Um, same for the Shaluk, haplo group A at fifty three. Haplo group B at 26. Uh, we see some of them have haplogroup group E3B as well, but we know that's because of introgression of those people coming over from Arabia, Yemen, and even um, North Africa. Um, even the Nubians, excuse me, even Anuba right here have um, haplogroup group A at around 46%, and even haplogroup group B at 14.3%. As well as other Nilotic tribes right here, such as the Nur, who are also said to be related to these peoples, such as the Dinka and the Shalut, having haplogroup A at high proportions and even haplogroup B. So um, those three tribes that I just identified with Kush, they have high proportions of haplogroup A and B. Uh, specifically, they have higher proportions of haplogroup A. Um, so can we reflect that with the earliest, you know, remains or the earliest peoples of the Sudan or Kush, the kingdom of Kush? And we really can. And to do that, we're going to go back to the genetic patterns of Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA variation with implications to the people of the Sudan to find out what haplogroups those ancient Nubians would have that we read about in Genesis 10. Um, and see if it matches up with those haplogroups that we just read about of the Nuba, also the Dinka, and the Shaluk. All right, because again, we saw how it kind of sounded like Isaiah was talking about these Dinka and Shaluk people as well in the book of Isaiah. So let's see if the haplotypes can, I guess you could say, collaborate with each other. All right, and again, I'm checking out the chat real quick. All right, Shalom, Shalom. All right, Toda, my brother. Toda, my brother. I'm glad you're enjoying it. All right, so let's read the abstract before we get into this uh, this article, or this journal, rather. It's really like a book. It's about 300 pages. <laughs> it's a, you should really read it if you have the time. But it says, the area known today as Sudan, um, we know Sudan to be ancient Nubia or Kush, may have been the scene of pivotal human evolutionary events, both, at, both as a corridor for ancient and modern migrations, as well as the venue of crucial past cultural ev um, evolution. Several questions pertaining to the um, pattern of succession of different groups in the early Sudan has been raised. To shed light on these aspects, ancient DNA and present DNA collected were made and studied using Y chromosome markers for a DNA and Y chromosome and empty DNA marker for the present DNA. Bone samples from different skeletal elements of burial sites from Neolithic, Moroic, Post-Moroic, Christian, and, excuse me, and Christian periods in the Sudan were collected from Sudan National Museum, and DNA extracted was successful in 35 out of 76 samples. PCR was performed for sex determination using a molecular marker. 14 samples were female and 19 were males. All right, so again. They were able to exonerate the genome from these bones, from the Neolithic, from the Moroic, from the post moroic and also from the Christian eras. So in doing this, haplogroups A, M13 was found at high frequencies among Neolithic samples, all right? So that's the ancient samples. The original people of that land would have been AM13. I'm gonna go back real quick just to show you this. 
Um, these tribes that are connected to the sons of Kush right here, they have high proportions of haplogroup A. All right. We see it right here. So again, haplogroup AM13 was found at high frequencies among Neolithic samples. Um, excuse me, it goes on to say haplogroup FM89, which would be like um, those J lineages and things like that, as well as the YAP lineages, what would be E1B1A, E1B1B, appear to be more frequent in among the Moroic period, the post moroic and also the Christian periods. Haplogroups BM60 was not observed in the sample analyzed. So we see at the own start of these populations in the Sudan and Nubia, haplogroup AM13 was present. As time went on, you start to get an integration of other lineages. It says accordingly, through limited, uh, oh, excuse me, it says accordingly, though limited on number of a DNA samples, there is enough data to suggest and to tally with the historical evidence of the dominance by Neolithic or Neolithic elements during the early stage, in, stage formation in the Nile Valley. And as the stage thrived, there was a dominance by other elements, particular Nuba slash Nubian. So even in this, this is telling you that those Nuba people, <laughs> those Nuba people that I brought out earlier are those Nubians, will in turn, who in turn would be descendants of Kush. Uh, let me start. Let me read this again. It says, accordingly, through limited on number of a DNA samples, there is enough data to suggest and to tally with the historical evidence of the dominance by Nilotic elements during the early stage, during the early state formation in the Nile Valley. And as the states thrived, there was a dominance by other elements, particularly Nuba slash Nubians. In Y chromosome terms, this means in simplest terms, introgressions of the YAP intersection haplogroups E and D, and Eurasian haplogroups, which are defined by haplo, um, haplotype FM89, against a haplogroup back or, or against background of haplogroup AM35 or AM13. The data analysis of the exact or the extent while chromosomes suggest that the bulk of genetic diversity appears to be a consequence of recent migrations and demographic events, mainly from Asian and Europe, evident in a higher migration from a migration rate for speakers of Afroasiatic as compared to the Nilo-Saharan family of languages and a generally higher evident effective population size for the farmer. All right. So again, as it said right here, according to the information, it shows or suggests that the bulk of the gen genetic diversity appears to be a consequence of recent migrations of these lineages, specifically the YAP lineages and also the FM89 lineages. All right, so the AM13 would have been the original population of the Kushites, all right, or within a original Kushite population. All right, one second while I check out the chat. Shalom, shalom, brother. Right, right, right. Yes, Ethiopians do have E one B one A. That's true. A few of uh, a minor percentage of Ethiopians do have E one B one A. Um, but again, that would have came in later. It would have um, been there on the on start. So, um, continuing, yeah, continuing on it to this source right here. Why chromosome variation among Sudanese restricted gene flow concordance with language, geography, and history. And it gets straight to the change right here. It says haplogroup frequencies in 15 Sudanese populations are given in figure two following YCC nomenclature. Haplogroups AM13, as we just read, um, was a part of the original um, Nubian or Kushite population, as well as BM16 are present at high frequencies in Nilo-Saharan groups, except Nubians. Um, with low frequencies in Afroasiatic groups, although not, or excuse me, although no table frequencies of BM60 were found in Hausa. And it's also 15.6, um, excuse me, BM60 is around or found in around 15, it's found in around 15.6% of the Hausa and also 15.2% of the cop. All right, excuse me, let me clear my throat real quick, family, and we can get back to
All right. So, again, so we can see that, again, BM60 is found in 15.6% of the Hausa and also 15.2% of the COPS. With, and also right here it goes on to say, one cluster relates to populations who speak languages of the Nilo-Saharan family, all right? And again, a lot of those Nubian or those people that we looked at who are connected to the Kushites would be Nilo-Saharan speakers, such as the Nuba, the Nubian, some the Dinka, those people. The predominant linguistic family in the Sudan across the millennia. This cluster is defined as the predominant of the ancestral haplogroup AM13 and BM60. So these are the native peoples to Eastern Africa. These A and B groups who would speak those Nilo-Saharan languages and even those people who will come from the Kushites who have AM13, as well as the common and most widely distributed haplogroup EM78. And we know EM78 would have came in later. All right, so let's continue. So now we're going to look at the Coptic Egyptians slash Nubians. The Coptic Egyptians slash Nubians. And here's even a few pictures that we have of the Copts. And we see they're a little melanated, a few of them melanated. I'm going to look at the Y chromosome and the history of the Coptic Egyptians and Nubians because they are in East and North Africa as well. Um, this will let us know who the ancient North Africans and even some of these people coming down into East Africa would have been as well from the own start. Again, just separating these ancient East and West Africans from these people with these E lineages. Going to the book African Unveiled by Reverend Henry Riley, it says that the ancient Egyptians are supposed to have been of the race of Mizraim, son of Ham. This um, supposition has the sanction of the Holy Scripture to the extent the common name of Egypt in the Bible is Mizraim, or more fully, the land of Mizraim. The Copts are descendants of the ancient Egyptians, but as Egypt has been subject for 3,000 years to successive invasion, foreigners, Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Arabs, and Turks, the distinctive physical features of the Aboriginal inhabitants are probably obliterated. All right, this is why you cannot go off of phenotypes, because if you go off phenotypes, you will say there's no sons of Ham um, in Egypt or even in, even in these locations in Africa where you see, you know, white phenotype. Um, that's why you have to look at something deeper like the Y chromosome, which we would do. We would look at the Coptic. Um, well, I, let me just continue to read this before I get into that. It says the heads of the Egyptian mommies have been examined by ethno um, lodges and are said to exhibit none of the distinguishing features of the true African. And it is therefore thought that they belong to the same race as the Europeans. This, however, does not at all follow, all right? This is not true. There are tribes in Eastern Africa as unlike the West African coast or the West Coast Negro as the mummies are in their cranial formation, but the resemblance between many of the Mangaja, a tribe with whom I lived for a time, and the Mangaja, or like a nilo saharan tribe as well. And the ancient Egyptians, as portrayed on the tombs and monuments, seem to me more favorable. The typical Negro is the delineated on some of these eye memorials of the past, but the resemblance that I noticed was to the acknowledged Egyptian type. It is not improbable that sometime after the first occupation by the Kushites, the Egyptians migrated in considerable numbers from Egypt and traveled down from or downstream the eastern coast of Africa, a considerable portion of which they may have um, occupied. All right. So we see right here that it is said that the cops are said to be descendants of the Egyptians. Why is that important? Because if we go back to this study, Y chromosome variation among Sudanese restricted gene flow coordinates with language, geography, and history. It actually mentions that you have Coptic descendants or Coptic Egyptians who migrated down into um, the, the Sudan or Nubia, like the last source just said. So let's read what it brings out about these specific Coptic Egyptians. It says the relatively high effective population size of the Copts is unlike or is, a, is unlikely to have been influenced by their recent history in the Sudan. The current communities are known to be largely the product of recent migrations from Egypt over the past two centuries. 
The cop samples displayed a most interesting Y profile, enough um, to suggest that they actually present or represent a living record of the peopling of Egypt. So the cops actually represent a living record of the peopling of, of Egypt, although some may be, you know, phenotypically lighter skinned. You do have dark skinned Coptic, Coptic Egyptians as well. Um, but we know that they like to only shine light or show the, the lighter skinned Egyptians. Um, although that is so, they actually show a living representation of those people migrating from Egypt into the Sudan. Why is this? Because the significant frequency of what? Haplogroup BM60 in this group might be a relic of a history of colonization of the southern Egypt, probably by Nilites in the early state formation, something that confirms both to record history and to Egyptian mythology. All right, so even the cops have haplogroup BM60. And again, this is just letting us know that in turn, these people will be related to these ancient Hermetic peoples in East and West Africa. We know if, if haplogroup BM60 was found amongst these people, it's, we can say that this is indeed a Hermetic group especially with them claiming to be descendants of Mizraim or Egypt. All right. So let me continue on. Right, 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 brother. Many cops do have haplogroup J. That is, that is facts. That is facts. But again, let me go back right here because I, it doesn't mention it right here, but it does mention it back here. It says specifically right here that the cops have 15%. Um, BM60 or yeah, BM60. So although they do have J, they do have BM60. So I guess with them do with them having BM60, they're basically agreeing that it is true that these cops do have origins of being you know Egyptians because their haplogroup reflected with them having that 15.2 percent BM60. All right. So let me continue on. So now we've dealt with Western Africa or Eastern Africa, rather. We saw that haplogroups B and A are specifically AM13 and haplogroups BM60 are those native East African haplotypes. So when people start to say modern day Ethiopians are the ancient descendants of Kush, specifically those with EM78, E1B1B, that's false. The ancient inhabitants of East Africa were your Nalots, your Nuba, your Dinka, your Shiluk, those type of people, those people that Isaiah talked about, those tall and smooth people, all right? Um, continuing. Um, so now we're about to deal with Western Africa or Western Ethiopia. Western Africa or Western Ethiopia. Now, this is very interesting because this is not, or before I can say that, show one more map. Um uh, showing another map showing Ethiopia within West Africa, just showing that, showing credence that there was or that there is a Western Ethiopia that could be considered Western Africa and even parts of Central Africa. Even right here it says Upper Ethiopia, and that's covering Central and Southeast Africa. All right. Now, what I was going to say is right here, specifically in this book, this um, Josephus mentioned something about other sons of Ham that's not mentioned within scripture. That's very interesting that I wanted to go deep into because I feel like it can be backed up with the information I'm about to bring out after this specific source. So in the complete works of Josephus, <clears throat> Antiquity of the Jews, the Wars of the Jews, against the um, Apion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on page 24, he mentions Ham having a son that settled Western Ethiopia um, by the name of Judas or Judatus. Um, right here it says that the children of these four, let me bring my highlighter back out so y'all can know where I'm starting, but it says the children of these four were these, um, the Sabas who founded the Sabians, Avilis who founded Avilian, um, who are called Gutili, Sabatis, founded the Sabatians. They are now called by the Greeks, Sorbians. Sabachas settled the Sabachians and Rugums, the Rugamians. And he had two sons, the one of which, Judatus, settled the Judatians, a or a nation of Western Ethiopians. All right. So 
is it possible that Josephus was talking about Western Africa? We know that Ethiopia has sometimes been referred to as the whole continent of Africa. So was he talking about Western Africa in a sense? And again, I just showed you maps of Western Africa um, or, or excuse me, specifically of Ethiopia being in West Africa. So with that, let's build on that. Could these people or could the ancient people of West Africa be descendants of Judeans or Judas, as you know, Josephus states? <clears throat> so to do that or to expound upon that, we're going to go back to the book Africa Unveiled um, again by Reverend Henry Vow or Revol. And right here, it gets very, very interesting. It says, but in Africa, you meet with the most remarkable illusions of physical differences, which exhibits between tribes and sometimes when they are most or almost contagious. For instance, between the fourth and sixth parallels of the north latitude and the 20th and 13th degrees of east latitude, we find the Nam Nam physical or physically a splendid race and the Aka, the so-called pygmies of Central Africa. All right, so again, I'm starting to deal with West and Central Africa to try to expound on these tribes or these people who could be descendants of this man named Judas that Josephus may mention of, who will be in turn a descendant of Ham. And the first people we'll be connecting this to is the pygmy tribe, specifically a pygmy tribe by the name of uh, Aka. And we have a pygmy tribe in West Central Africa right here. Um, let me get my holla or my circle out so we can circle this. They are actually known as the Baka or the Aka, all right? And they're in West Africa, West Central Africa, and they are pygmies, all right? Um, so again, the Aka, the so-called pygmies of Central Africa. Um, it says the average height of the Aka was four to four, to, or excuse me, the average height of the Aka was four feet, four, 10 inches, all right? So again, this is talking about these pygmies of West and Central Africa. We know that these are the native peoples to West and Central Africa. The Akar or the Aka are evidently a branch of that series of dwarf races, which are with some reason supposed to extend along the equatorial regions right across the continent. Du Chalu, when in Ashanago land, Western Africa met a race of dwarfs who were called Obongo. All right, so even further west, even all the way further west in, in Western Africa, there were dwarfs or pygmy races that they found. Again, could these be descendants of those people that Josephus made mention to, the Western Ethiopians? The Bushmen and the Earthmen of the South Africa are probably an offshoot, the Parias, in fact, of these equatorial pygmen. It says for these or for there seems to be a considerable physical resemblance between them. All right. So, again, before I move on, the Aka pygmies of West Africa um, possibly are descendants of these Western Ethiopians that um, we know Josephus may mention to. And, of course, we know that a lot of these pygmies would have those be haplotypes. All right. We've established that since the beginning of this presentation. All right. And I'm looking at the chat. I just want to answer this one quick comment the brother just made, the brother Jay Goddard. Um, when looking at the Dogon or looking at the Dogon haplotype makeup, they have like half of them who would be Native African. So you do have another half of those people who possibly would be connected to um, the Mendy people. Because, again, I do know that the Mendy people or excuse me, I do know that the Dogon are said to come from the Mali Empire with the Mandy people. So they have a split genome, if that makes sense. Um, so continue to build upon what we just looked into, the pygmies being the native people of West Africa, connecting those peoples to the Western Ethiopians or the Judeans. And to do that, we're gonna to go to a short history of African pygmies, diverse people inherit their stature from the same recent ancestors. It says short people known as pygmies are scattered across equatorial Africa, where they speak various languages, inhabit different types of forests, and hunt and gather food in diverse ways. Despite their cultural variety, a new study shows that pygmies of Western Central Africa descended from ancestral populations that survived intact until 2,800 years ago, 
when farmers invaded the pygmies' territories and split them apart. Family in the chat, who are these farmers that came into West Africa and split these pygmies apart? Can someone answer that for me? I'm going to continue on. I'm going to see if anyone throws that answer. Who are these invading farmers that came into West and Central Africa and split these pygmy tribes apart? The origins of pygmies have long been a mystery. Facts, 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 brother. Um, a higher be praised. Facts. The origins of the pygmies have long been a mystery. Researchers have debated whether the African pygmies inherited their height from a common ancestor that sh or that they shared it long ago, or whether shortness evolved from independently in each tribe because it was adventurous for life in the forest. All right, so I'm going to skip some of this just to get to the meat of it. Skip to this last highlighted proportion right here where it says in the largest or in the largest study of Western Central Africans to date, anthropological geneticist Paul Verdu of the Muse or the Museum of Man in Paris and colleagues analyzed DNA from nine pygmy mummies or pygmy groups and 12 neighboring groups of people who were of normal height. The researcher reports in this week issue of current biology that although pygmies have a lot of genetic diversity, they probably can trace their ancestry to the same population that could have lived as recent as 2,800 years ago, says Verdi. So again, these peoples, these pygmy peoples would have been in West Africa um, up until 2,800 years ago until they were invaded by farmers. So again, before, before 2,800 years ago, these pygmies would have been the ancient peoples of West and Central Africa. It says, in the most likely scenario, a small group of short people split off from non-pygmy populations between 5,000 to 9,000 years ago. The founding group of pygmy ancestors was fairly cohesive, with tribes interbreeding until 2,800 years ago. At that point, taller, Bantu-speaking farmers probably swept across Central Africa and pushed them apart. This is how we know West, or this is how we know Bantus are not native to West Africa. This is how we know pygmies are the native people to West Africa, because they were actually pushed out of West and Central Africa by these Bantus. Once the pygmy group split, they stopped interbreeding. As a result, each group evolved separately. Even today, they seldom known, or excuse me, they seldom known of each other's existence, says Verdun. The study also detects an unusual pattern. More DNA flows from non-pygmy neighbors into pygmy populations than the other way around. All right. This is why we saw Bantus. Um, this is why we see a lot of Bantus with haplogroup B2B. All right. Because it's sentence right here. This is curious because pygmy women tend to marry non-pygmy men and move to their homes, not vice versa. But these marriages often fail because of discrimination against low status pygmy wives, Verdu says, and the pygmy women return to their pygmy groups with children who have DNA with their taller fathers. This is also why certain pygmies have E1B1A. You can find pygmy tribes with E1B1A for this very reason as well, because the pygmy women return to their pygmy groups with the children who have DNA from their taller fathers, like the Bantus. All right. So, Continuing to build on that, we're almost done. We're almost done um, with this um, presentation. So, again, we just showed that these pygmies and things like this were these native peoples in West Africa, possibly connecting these peoples to, you know, those Western Ethiopians that Josephus made of, Judas. Now we're going to look into the Y chromosome of these pygmies again and show that they are not related to um, I guess you could say modern day West Africans, like your Igbo, like your Yoruba, like your Bamalike, like your Bantu groups, like your Mendi, right? And even in East Africa, um, your, Am your Amhara, your Omoro, um, who else do we have? Your Tigres, a lot of your other Ethiopian groups, a lot of those people with those E groups came in later, all right? So reading from this book right here, ancient or reading from this journal right here, Ancient West African forgers in the context of African population history. 
It says all of the MT and Y chromosome haplogroups we observed in Shum Lanka are associated today with Sub-Saharan Africans. The two earlier individuals carry MT DNA haplogroup L0A, which is widespread in Africa. And the two later individuals carry MC, which is found among both farmers and hunter gatherers in Central and West Africa. Individuals L2, or excuse me, individual 2SEI and 4A have Y chromosomes from macro haplogroup B, often found today in hunter gatherers from Central Africa. And 2C or 2SE2 has the rare Y chromosome haplogroup group A00, which was discovered in 2013 and is present at applicable frequencies only in Cameroon, in particular among the Mbo and the Bagua in the western part of the country. All right, so when looking in ancient Shumlaka, we're digging up these ancient samples. They didn't find E1B1A. All right, they didn't find Ebo-related ancestry. They didn't find Bantu-related ancestry. They found hunter-gatherer-related ancestry, specifically haplogroups B and A, as it stated. Going over to the next um, right-handed side right here and dealing with the PCA analysis that they did. Um, it says, initially, we computed axes used in East and West Africans and hunter-gatherers from Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. The Shumlaka individual project to the right of present-day West African populations and speakers of Bantu languages, hereafter Bantu speakers, and are closest to present-day hunter-gatherers from Cameroon, such as the Baka, the Bacola, and the Benza, and Central African Republic, such as the Aka, also known as the Biaka, the tribe we already brought out. All right, these would be those ancient, those ancient West Africans. It's, it's really that simple, family. All right, so again, when people want to, you know, say, you know, we've been in West Africa for thousands of years, or we are ancient to West Africa, just throw out some of these names to them, the Baka, the Bacola, the Bendiza. The Aka, all right, these are the ancient West Africans. Um, these are the sons of Ham, right? It says, when then carried, or we then carried out a second PCA using only West and East Africans and Aka to compute the axis. And again, the Shumlaka individual project in this direction of hunter gatherers from Western Africa. By contrast, present day groups from Western Cameroon who speak languages from Niger Congo family cluster tightly with other. West Africans, all right? So again, Niger Congo group or people who speak the Niger Congo group, they cluster tightly with other West Africans opposed to this Shumlaka burial site or these Shumlaka remains. So again, to wrap this specific source up, it says, our knowledge of ancient human population structure in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly prior to the advent of food production all right, who brought in food, food production, the Bantus, all right? It remains limited, or not just the Bantus, the Afroasiatics, period, right? The EP2 haplotypes. It says, here we report genome-wide DNA data from four children, two whom were buried approximately 8,000 years ago, and two, excuse me, and two from 3,000 years ago from Shunlaka one of the earliest known archaeological sites within the probable homeland of the Bantu language group, all right? And I want you to notice the language that they pointed out here because, you know, Cameroon, as they say, it could be the homeland of this so-called language group known as the Bantu, but it's not the homeland of E1B1A, all right? I think we get that confused sometimes, all right? It's not the homeland of E1B1A. But it goes on to say one individual carried the deeply divergent Y chromosome haplogroup A, which today is found almost exclusively in the same region. However, the genome-wide ancestry profiles of all four individuals are most similar to those of present-day hunter-gatherers from Western Central Africa, which implies that populations in Western Cameroon today, as well as speakers of Bantu languages from across the continent, are not descended substantially from the population represented by these four people, all right? So again, 8,000 to 3,000 years ago, you did not have people within West Africa who were related to Bantus, all right? And that's throughout all the continent. And again, those haplotypes found in ancient West Africa was haplogroup B, A0, 
and B2B. So let's continue. So now we're about to wrap it up again by showing once more that the Bantus were not, or the, yeah, the Bantus were not the ancient inhabitants of West Africa, not even of East Africa. Um, if I need to, once I wrap this up, I can show the migration of people with E1B1B into East Africa um, from places like Yemen. But let me read this source right here. And this is coming from the World of Africa, Color and Demography by W.E. Du Bois. Um, it was actually edited by Henry, or Henry Louis Gates, Jr. And right here it says they remain in the southwestern part of what is now the Angolan Egyptian Sudan until 300 or 400 BCE, dealing with the Bantus. Matter of fact, let me start right here. Let's start off at the top of the paragraph. It says possibly, possibly the first of the ancient Bantu tribes moved eastward towards the mountain Nile and the Great Lakes from the valley of the north of the Albert in Yaza. They remained in the southwest part of what is now the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan until 300 or 400 BC when they started south. Probably at the beginning of the Christian era, the Bantu were settled on the Indian Ocean, and there the Arab traders cultivated relations with them and mingled their blood. Eventually, the Bantu invaded the Congo Basin, already possibly inhabited by Negroes of West African type and the pygmies. All right. So again, already inhabited by Negroes of the West African type and the pygmies. First, the Bantus went around or went round and not through the forest, but finally they broke through the forest and sent migrants across the Congo land as far as the coast where they met the West African Negro culture. All right. So then again, that's where you get the expansion of E1B1A and two West African. Continuing on, ancestral DNA, human origins, and migrations. Source to the left. We're going to start right here at the highlighted. Matter of fact, we're going to read this whole page. It says, independent of whether the Bantu dispersion resulted from transmission of ideas and technology, actual movement of people, or a combination of the two, the fact is that the aftermath has been profound in and outside of Africa, actively and passively. The Bantu phenomenon changed Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond forever. In general, it had a powerful homogenization effect, reducing the amount of diversity. All right. So that's what the Bantu, um, guess you could say migration did. It reduced the amount of diversity. This is why you see um, E1B1A dominate in Sub-Saharan Africa, because these people came in and they displaced and they... Uh, we're actually going to read what they did. Let me just continue. It says most of the untoxious populations south of the Sahara were impacted. To various extents, native populations lost their language and culture. Why? Because of the Bantus. This wealth of heritage vanished almost completely in some instances and particularly in others. The strength of the Bantu punch was so strong and very depending on the location, social culture condition at the same time in Indonesia in concert and soon after. The, re the end result of this process was the assimilation of the Bantu way of life by the indigenous peoples and the elimination of native singularities, all right? So if the Bantu is assimilating and eliminating peoples, that means those lineages are starting to die out. That means their males, uh, I guess you could say that means their haplogroup is starting to expand more, especially when you take into account they're killing their men and they're taking their women and reproducing with their women. Not only are they reproducing with one woman, they're probably taking two, three women and reproducing with two, three women, having multiple kids who they will pass that hap haplotype down to. This is why we see, again, E1B1A encompassing most of Southern Africa. Bantu dis, um, dismetted, excuse me, Bantu's disseminated the practice of ag agriculture throughout their domain. Novel crops were introduced and improved by human origin, excuse me, human artificial selection. Furthermore, domestication of animals was spread into areas where it was not previously practiced. This is also how we know um, Bantus are not ancient West Africans because ancient West Africans did not do things like what was just read, domestication of animals. 
These changes brought with them profound shifts in social culture modes, as in other world places where agriculture and domestication originated and flourished in Sub-Saharan Africa. It allowed for the storage of surplus food. This event had profound consequences. It freed humans from having to search for the substance on a daily basis. All right. The previous practice of foraging, excuse me, the previously practiced foraging way of life demanded considerable amounts of time and effort. As agrarian peoples, we were now able to feed on previously accumulated supplies as such as grains and dry meat, as well as continuous sources of milk and dairy products. All right. So the Bantus brought domestication of animals and they also brought food agriculture into sub-Saharan Africa. That was not there 3,000 years ago. Or let me go back a little further. That was not there 8,000 years ago. That was not there 10,000 years ago. Um, this was just brought there recently in the BC period. All right. And I believe this is the last slide. Yep, it is. So I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for tuning in. Go back and check out the chat, see what's going on. Um, read what's going on in the chat. I will drop the link real quick for anyone who wants to come up. Let me see real quick. Then I'll check out these comments. Let's see what you all been getting into. All right, so let me move back up. So here's the John link. And now I will deal with comments. So now's the time to ask questions if you have any. Ask questions if you have any. Click the link if you would like to come up and add to the conversation or add anything. The bar. So let me see where I can start from. You all have a lot of questions. What well, is a lot of comments? I want to read them. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Well, where should I start? Yeah, y'all said a lot of good info. I'm trying to find a good place to start. Let's see. Right, you want okay, yes. I answered that. Yes, me. Right. So many Ethiopians have A and B lineages, right? Those would be the original descendants of Ham, um, Kush. They could also be descendants of Shiva and Havila, descendants of Ham as well. Um, it's just, again, more information we have to get into. We can't identify every descendant of Shem. We can't identify every descendant of Ham, but um, we can do that on a genetic level. We can say, hey, at least we know for sure the sons of Ham would be these lineages. We know for sure the sons of Shem would be these lineages. You know, as facts, many um, Arabians do have E1, B1A. As facts, that's facts. That's facts. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, a lot of Arabians have E one B one A. Got the brother's second Exodus. What's going on? Shalom, shalom. Shalom, brother. I'm shalom. Just, I'm traveling, so my signal might be pretty bad. So I just want to give you a heads up. Oh no, you good? It's good. I my, I got a good question about the. Uh, of the DNA test. Say that one time you got a confession? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, a question about oh, okay. African ancestry tests. Uh, okay. Yeah, with Rick Kettles, Henry Louis Gates. Um, Henry Louis Gates uh, did an investigation, so did 60 Minutes on the African ancestry test. And, and they said that there's no way to tell. Uh, ethnicity based on half and so when you know I took the African ancestry test I took both the patri and the patri and it said that my patri was Mamaleke and Iwanda and my patri plant was uh, from Ful it was Fulani and uh, Yoruba so I wanted to get your take on that how, uh, what what now that we're learning more about, you know, how DNA works, uh, what do we do, you know, when we're, when our brothers and sisters talk about the African ancestry So basically you're saying that Sir Henry Louis Gates stated that why DNA haplogroups cannot tell you what specific ethnic group you descend from. 
That's that's correct because uh, uh, Rick Kittle over African ancestry said that Henry Louis Gates, uh, his Y chromosome comes from uh, the ancient Egyptians, mm -hmm. and so that makes him ancient. Uh, makes him Nubian. Right, right. And you said in your case, your haplogroup went back to the Yoruba and the Fulani? My maternal DNA, according to African ancestry, went back to the Yoruba and Fulani, but my uh, Y chromosomes on African ancestry went back to Bamaleke and Iwondo from Cameroon. Okay. So about that statement that he said about Y chromosomes not being able to tell you your direct um, to link you to a direct ethnicity. Um, I will agree and disagree. I can give you two answers to that. I would say, I would say the reason he stated that is because, um, for example, two separate tribes can have the exact same Y DNA haplotype mutation, um, SMP, and everything. All right. So you can say, for example, the Yoruba can be. Um, let's just say E1B1A7 and the Ebo can be E1B1A7 and they have the exact same mutations within their population. Say you go take your African ancestry test. It's going to say that you're Yoruba or Ebo or both. That's just because they both share that specific haplotype. So in a sense, it can't tell you what specific overall population you would descend from. It's just taking you back to that common population, like I like I just made mention to, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of like how I looked at it. I was explaining to my sister earlier. I have a I have a half brother. We got the same dad. If my half brother's descendants start all calling themselves Muslims for the next two hundred years, and all my descendants start calling themselves I don't know uh, Israelites for the next two hundred years. When one of the, when one of those groups take a test, they'll have similar DNA, mm -hmm. so they'll they'll see that you know, hey, you know that doesn't mean that they're descended from the Muslim side. It just means that we share the same common ancestors. Right, right. So that's a, that's what I think he means by that. But I I do disagree. Like I said, I agree and I disagree. I disagree because um, there are certain haplogroups groups that's not that's only found in one specific population. Right. So if you get that specific haplo, say let's let's say you find let's see, let's say you used to take an African ancestry and you got a haplo if you and your haplotype B2B, that's found specifically in pygmies, right? That's an instance where it's gonna link you back. Well, I guess you can I guess you can kind of go against that as well, because I guess you can say different pygmy tribes will have that same haplotype, but again, I guess you get what I'm saying, but I do agree with that and disagree. I get, yeah, I get what you're saying. One last thing I want to bring up is uh, family tree DNA. Mm -hmm. They um, they specifically focus on people's uh, haplogroups, and so um, I hadn't bought a test, but 23Me got more specific with my haplogroup. At first, it was EM. I think it was EV38. Right, it gave you the whole breakdown. But it gave me more breakdown after like a last update. So now I'm EC6010. Mm -hmm. I put that's like E1B1A1A1C1, stuff like that. Right. So I, I plugged that into uh, Google and it pulled up Family Tree where there was people with the same EC6010 uh, that I have. And most of that was found in Senegambia. You know, like most of it was from Ghana. Gambia, one from Senegal and one from Arabia that had the exact same haplogroup that 23Me uh, gave me. Right, right. Same one chromosome. Right. So that kind of, in a way, it kind of, and you know, you see what I'm saying? So it's almost like the 60 Minutes News um, article and the and the the interview or the documentary done by Henry Louis Gates kind of confirms that African ancestry, in so many words, you know, I won't say we're making it up completely, but just kind of randomly giving us, you know, ethnicities based on their database that they had 
a while right. ago. Right, and, and it could be, and it could be there. You know, like I say, they're connecting you to specific mutations that's only found in you know certain groups. You know, with E one B one A, right? Because like, like it's even what you what you just said. You you're seeing the E one B one A clade in um, Arabia. If you was to take a, a Arabian Y paternal ancestry test. <laughs> You probably get linked to an Arabian tribe, you know, if that if that is a certain thing. But because again, Arabians do have E one B one A. Just showing, you know, how that the whole thing he said doesn't really, you know, make sense. Um, because again, that's what that's exactly what why chromosomes do. They trace your ancestry back to these to these populations. But yeah, I appreciate it. That. That's all I share. So. Appreciate that. No problem, no problem. Shalom, brother Isaiah. Shalom, what's going on? Shalom. What's going on? What's going on? I want to say this is some good information that you brought out. I appreciate that, my brother. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, for I want to. I want to. Uh, I want to share with you something that I read from Babylon from Timbuktu. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Before you do that, I want to re- I want to answer this real. I want to answer this question real quick. Um Okay, but just on um, the the question or the comment says, um I think you should do a video showing what the other sons of Shem like Lud, Elam, Aram, Joktan, the Ishmaelites, Moab, and Ammonites. I do have a brother. Brother, if you're watching, go ahead and get your stuff together cuz um I do have a brother that you know, does have a theory or have the information, has a presentation on um, a possible connection to the sons of blood. So hopefully um, once he gets his information on together with that, we can bring him on so he can present it. And I'm definitely looking forward for it. Um, as far as Jockton, I could bring something out on Jockton as well. Again, Jockton would connect to a lot of Ethiopians. <laughs> a little do people know, but go ahead, Brother Isaiah. It was something I was reading about Muhammad, mm-hmm. and, the, and the thing the thing is, they said that Muhammad he got so interested in our customs, and I was shocked by that. Say that again. I was reading about Muhammad, and they said that Muhammad he got so interested into the Jewish customs that he actually got the Bible and started to. Um, to copy it about what we had in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I also read that Muhammad, he slaughtered black Jews because they did not want to convert to his new religion, Islam. Right, right. So that, yeah, he definitely would have been laying that sword down for those who didn't want to convert, you know, Jews, whoever was in the area, for sure. And you know what's funny? The Nation of Islam and Farrakhan, they don't even uh, talk about that. No, nah, they don't. They don't. They don't like them. They don't like to bring up their history. A lot of people in West Africa today who are like this question right here, like like, for instance, the Bambara, who are, you know, Muslims, the Mandi people, the Suniki, a lot of those people today, they were not practicing Muslims prior to what, 1072, the Amorite invasion. So that's true. So even, even when they came down, even when they came down into West Africa, they converted um, the Jews and, you know, forced them to convert and tried to kill them as well. Exactly. So that's and something I, that's a common practice and, amongst them. And I want to add something. Farrakhan has been saying for decades that we are the children of Israel, but still he's not even converting those, his followers out of Islam to the Israelite um faith no nah, he's not he's not you know it's all politics man um you know i don't know why i always wondered why farrakhan you know claimed to be or s- said certain things that hint towards him knowing that you know black americans had these sinners of israel amongst them um but yet still proclaiming to be a muslim especially dealing with the facts of um the history of West Africa, like I said, man, before the transatlantic slave trade, that what was going on in West Africa. Um, a lot of those Berbers, uh, Torags, 
Um, and even some of our own people that converted to Islam, they was laying the sword down. Right. Yeah, but I'm not I'm not shocked by this because the most high he said in the land of our captivity is that we will serve other gods. I'm not shocked by that though. Yeah, me neither, me neither. But let me read this. So the brother says, So are pygmies Hamites? I don't understand. Yes, pygmies would be Hamites. Um, brother, as I brought out, they, they do have um Haplo group B. Um, so yeah, they would be Hamites. Haplo group B is a native paleo African. Hunter gatherer type of haplotype. Not only that, it's related to haplogroup A, which was found in ancient Nubia, representing um the ancient Kushites. So yeah, it is a son of Ham. Yeah, I got a quick question. Go ahead, brother. Um, you know, um haplogroups uh, A and B were the oldest or the original. Um, how do you differentiate, you know, because we know Ham, Sham, and Japheth, you know, they should have all the, the same apple group, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we differentiate when that change play, took place? Like, you know, did all the sons of Ham, Sham, and Japheth have apple group A, and then some of the descendants of Ham Sham or Japheth had happened for B. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I'm saying, is it kind of, do we get the timelines off? Is the timeline off? Because it's kind of throwing me off. If if everybody had Apple Group A and they split off and, and developed unique mutations, but it has nothing to do with uh, difference in time, then it would make more sense to me. Right. So <laughs> if you're looking back, Right, right. So if you look into yeah. um look at specific timelines for matching up the hyplo groups to the biblical narrative, I would um advise you to go and check out the brother Hebrew of Israel channel where he gives the young earth model of the biblical timeline and haplotype or Y chromosome haplotypes and also the old earth model with the biblical narrative and Y chromosome haplotypes. But as far as your first part of the question, me personally, or from the information I've gathered, I do believe that um, if, well, considering the biblical narrative, like you said, Noah would have passed his haplogroup down to his sons. His sons would have had the same haplogroup. Um, he dropped out. But I'll continue to answer that question. Um, like I was saying, so Noah would have passed this haplogroup down to his sons, his three sons. His three sons would have had the same haplogroup. And that's times the verse. And time went on, and as those populations went in their respective locations, the territories of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, um, those sons would have mutated into their respective clades, A and B, D and E, and C and F. Um, did you hear that, brother? Or did you were you dropped out the full time when I was saying that? Second Exodus. Yeah, I think he's still, I think he's still trying to get back in. But the brother Jay Glider or Guider says E1A is found in Oyo, Mandi, in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Italy, Sardinia, Ukraine. Yeah, it is. It is. Are you saying E1A is Jewish, brother Jay Guider? Are you saying E1B1A is Judah? Uh, brother Will. What's going on? Uh, do you uh, have conversations with our brothers and sisters in a diaspora that are of Israelite blood? Yes. Yes, I do. Definitely. I thought I thought it would be interesting for them to come on one day so we can talk. Are you talking about like a big group conversation? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can get that together one day. I can talk to a few people, see what's going on. Oh, something together. That'll be cool. Yeah, because a big portion of them don't even know that they are the Northern Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So this is, wait one second, one second. She says, this is so true. I am Booby Tika. Booby is one of the pygmy. Mm. Is that on your mother's side? 
Um, Sister Miriam. Booby, that's in what location? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think more than likely Central Africa, West Africa. Also, this comment is true as well. Homer um, wrote about the, the pygmies being on the Nile River as well um, back in the day. But the brother Jacob Israel says pygmies are depicted in ancient Egyptian art. And it is rumored that normal Egyptian um, first king was a pygmy. Um, like I said, Homer wrote about pygmies living on the Nile and in Egypt as well. So that, that is interesting. Something to dig into. Um, hold on, what's going on? Um, the brother says he won't be on A and he won't be on B, being as old as they are, and both being Israel is an anomaly. Um, but in Ebo, you will see D even and D still call themselves Ebro, so tons of research is still needed. I don't get what you're saying, brother. What are you saying, brother? I don't get what you're saying, honestly. I guess I'll uh, go, go ahead. Uh, one, do you mind uh, sharing your 23andMe results on the screen? Say it again. Do you mind sharing your 23andMe DNA results on the screen? I'm still waiting on my results to come in or to finish up. I just like got done doing a swab a few weeks ago. So hopefully that'll be back soon. Oh, and another thing I want to ask, is it possible for us as black Americans to trace our family tree all the way back to King David or Jacob? <laughs> uh, if you descend from this, it's, I believe it is possible. It'll, it'll be hard. It'll be hard. It'll be easy if you descend from a Sephardic Jew. <laughs> If you just learn from a Sephardic Jew, it'll be easier. But nah, not not um not our tribes. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Maybe if we can um do a deeper study, um, not just looking at the the face value of it now, but maybe maybe I do know um you have certain Akan clans that um came descent from the high priest Eli. But as far as King David, I'm not sure. Um, the Saniki claim that Dinga was a descendant of King Solomon. <laughs> so if that's real, or if he's actually a descendant of King Solomon, then that would be a line of people amongst the Saniki. So the brother Jake Glider says, yeah, Jacob Israel, Dogon is the only name that even comes close to Dagatun. Um, couple that went Dagon share culture with Ebo and Better Israel. It's actually a people that I know, um, who connects to those Dagatoons and they have the pretty same name. It is not the Dogon people, I wouldn't consider the Dogon. When you showed the um, the Hapa groups of different tribes in Africa, I was shocked to see that the Limba tribe was not even on the screen. Oh no! I just screenshotted those. Um, I can go to it um in full, but I just screenshotted those specific um not a lot of tribes I wanted to show those that I went over. But even on that, the, the yeah the limbo's not mentioned on that specific um that specific Wikipedia page. It's more likely they probably be from E1B1A. Nah, they. <laughs> you want me to bring up? The um haplo group distribution. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I had to get on some brothers for this. You know, um, you know, it's a lot of YouTubers out there saying African Americans are closely um are closer to the limbo than they are to West Africans. And um, uh, you get limbo in your jet match. That mean you, that mean you descend from a limbo. So, and this right here, this genetic study really puts that to rest. And I'm gonna why is is this one second because I keep getting a bot in the chat posting you know inappropriate things so I keep blocking it but it keep coming back. Right, they yeah. always doing it. They always doing it on everybody's channel. 
They keep coming back. I keep blocking it. But once I read this, I'm going to try to get caught up with these questions in the chat. It's a lot. Let's see. Let me go back up where the questions at. Then I'm going to pull this up. But I wanted to answer this before I got started. No, the Tikar people are basically – well, the Tikar people are not the Tikar people. They're not related. So let me bring up this right quick so I can show this brother the breakdown of the limbo because this is an example of why phenotype does not matter. You know what I'm saying? And why it's important to look at the Y chromosome of these peoples. Because this is what the brothers was doing. You know, they they look at, um, what's it called? Jed match. And they'll see that they have limbo number one on their um, results. And they believe that they limbo. Little do they know. But this is coming from Limbo Origins Revisited, tracing the ancestry of Y chromosome in South Africa and Zimbabwe and Limbo. I'm just get straight to the meat of it. Matter of fact, should I read this? It says, using the distribution of Y chromosome haplogroups in the global populations, haplogroups B, also EM2 and EM40, were used to trace the African ancestry of the Y chromosomes in the combined Limbo and Rimba populations all right so they do have em2 they have e1b1a they also have haplogroup b and they also have em40 but they also have haplogroups f j k l p and r that were used to trace the non-african contribution amongst the limbo right and even right here i believe they say something like em35 is um, used as a non-African source. Right here it says to, yeah, it says the EM35 chromosomes were used as a non-African source within this population. So that's even, they counted one of the E1B1B lineages as a, I guess you could say Arabian source opposed to African. So looking at the chart right here, we can see clearly that they, they are, you know, a highly mixed population. Uh, we see EM40, like we said already right here, EM40, EM2. Uh, we see a few of them with EM35. <clears throat> we see a few of them with haplogroup F. That's not African um, or Afro-Asiatic. Um, that's not African or J right here is not African. Um, JM172 is not African. KM9 is not African. LM11 is not African. Um, RM is not African. Um, JM267 is not African. Um, the so-called Ashkenazi Jewish JP58 is not African either, as well as the JM12. And that's all found within the limbo population. So, yeah, brother. You got uh, that? What, tribe, what tribe do they claim uh, they're from? They claim to be Levites. I'm not saying that they're not Israelites, but I'm not saying that their oral tradition is not true. They still could have, you know, migrated from the same place. They just would have been coming with different, um, I guess you could say different lineages with them. I believe EM2 would have been with them as well. I'm a part of them migrating into Africa, but they would have brought different lineages. Um, or I guess you could say doing their migration. You got that, brother? Yeah. I uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask a question about that. Okay. So I, I watched Tudor Parfitt's, uh, he had a documentary just recently on uh, the History Channel. It was playing for about two or three days. In the past. And they were talking about the Natufians. And so, the, you know, they, well, they weren't talking about the Natufians, my bad. They were talking about the uh, Limbo and how they had a, a Y chromosome to call him model pack. But they never, they, they always are vague with the, the haplogroup of it's, the limbo. I'm finna show it. Go ahead, keep talking. Yeah, they're, they're very vague with the haplogroup. They will say that they have Middle Eastern origins or it comes from the Levant and Yemen and stuff, but they never talk about what haplogroup the limbo have. And even, you know, at one time, they wouldn't even show the limbo haplogroup a long time on, on Google. Right. So, my question is, why do you? Why don't they uh, talk about the Natufians? How the Proto-Semitic, and 
and with you know most internal uh, haplogroup of the proto-Semitic Natufian had haplogroup E1B1, which is more specific than just saying haplogroup E. And and why don't they talk about the haplogroup of the uh, Limba people openly? And and what they're directly referring to as the Kohen model haplotype. And 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 my I guess my last question is uh, somebody mentions that haplogroup E or Natufians are Canaanites. <laughs> do, you, do you uh do you uh you know how would you go about debunking that? that I, will go, the I will go about de debunking that by showing them um the Neolithic samples of the kingdom of Kush, um showing them that that haplogroup is A M13. And if the sons of Canaan um, excuse me, if the son of Canaan is actually a son of Ham, his haplogroup would have to be related to the son of Cush. Therefore, it cannot be E. So that's not um that's not monophylactic. Even with that, I can go into showing, well, I guess that's newer. So that's how I would do it. And I will also show him the Afroasiatic origins of haplogroup E and also the Natufians. So I don't th I don't think it would be hard to show how um E is not Canaan, right? Because majority of majority of Canaan's brothers are in Africa, and we and we know their chromosome, right? So it will have to match. And also, to answer why you say why don't they shine light on what specific haplotype they're talking about amongst the Limba? Um, I believe it's because within academia, within their field, within the people they're talking to, overwhelmingly. They know what that um, Cohen model haplotype is. They know that they're talking about um, haplogroup JP58, which is found in the Ashkenazi Jews. Um, so that's why they really like to say it because they have the same haplotype that's found in the Ashkenazi Jews. Um, also, Ashkenazi Jews have E1B1A like the Limba. Also, Ashkenazi Jews have E1B1B like the Limba. They don't like to say that. Not only that, to go with that, there's not just um, a haplogroup J, I guess you could say Cohen model haplotype. There's also um, an E1B1B Cohen model haplotype. And also, now that I think of it, now that we look into the limbo population and we see um, that they do have E1B1A and they claim to be Cohen's, that just made E1B1A possibly a Cohen model haplotype as well. Yeah, that make, that makes sense, and 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 here's something I find interesting that nobody wants to make a connection with. If you go to Wikipedia and you look up the, if you look up Ogarma, which is a son of uh, Gomer, and a Japheth, it would say that Togarmas is the ancestor of Armenian people. When you look up the haplogroup of the Armenians, it's predominantly haplogroup R J. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you look at uh, haplogroup C, T, and F, and F being the progenitor of haplogroups G, H, I, J, K, uh, M, N, O, P, Q, R, you know, there's no way you can, you know, not see that this is coming from a, a an entirely different haplogroup, you know, as far as, you know, if we were to say ham, you know, ham, sham, and JFET, if we overwhelmingly see that Europeans uh, have proto-Semitic culture and their haplogroups are E, e at least E1B1, how can, how can they ignore the fact that Armenians who have haplogroup R and J, which branch off the same root, how can they ignore the fact that the Armenians are claiming descent from Togarma, who's a son of Jason? Right. So, I mean, how, how clearly, like, bring that, you know, shine some light on that for people to understand. How can we shine light on the fact that um, basically Jay invaded into the Levant? Well, not necessarily, not necessarily the Levant, but how Jay springs from the same root as haplogroup F, 
and and people with haplogroup group J at least are claiming descent from Togarma, and Togarma is a sign of faith. You, you see what I'm saying? Right, right. So you you're basically trying to see how we can prove that he's a descendant of Japheth. Well, you know, Go ahead. what I, what I'm saying is is that you you have to have only one father with one Y chromosome. There's no way you can be. There's no way you can say haplogroup J, the Cohen model haplogroup, is right. submitting if it's linked to a Japhetic branch. Right. Right. You know. I, J, and K belong to the same branch as R. Exactly. Like, you see what I'm saying? So R, G, H, I, J, all of that, that all comes from F. Not only that, they all have the same M89 SNP. Yeah, that's what so, I'm saying. Yeah. That's, how, that's what I'm saying. That's how, we, that's how we know these things are connected, brother. Like, you, yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I just wanted to know how we can shine more light on that and make it clear for people to understand. There's no way you can say that Cohen model haplogroup is Semitic. It's directly linked to haplogroup F and people with haplogroup R or J are claiming descent from Togarma. Togarma is the brother of Ashkenaz. Correct. And then for our, our people who think Native Americans are Israelites, the M N O P Q and the C and the T lineages that still come from the same root as F. Oh, second is yeah. You know that they're claiming Native Americans are from Gad, and that's that's false. But if you see the tribe of Gad, it's actually talking about the Zulu people. Yeah, I, I mean. Yeah, I could, I can, so I could see that. But I mean, there's so there's so many brothers out there, and I notice IUIC is starting to say that they're starting to not mention Native Americans as much. They're starting to say uh, Negroes and Hispanics or Blacks and Hispanics, and they leave the Native American part off. So is that because they're starting to realize that they can't keep saying that, or? I'm, I'm going to tell you something. The only reason why they're preaching that fake chart is because they want to marry strange women. Well, you know, they don't have to make a whole group of people, Israelites, to do that. I mean, all you got to do is, you know, have them believe in the same God and keep the culture. That's all. No, no. What I'm saying is they just want to marry Gentile women. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. But I, I'm saying that they know, maybe they don't know that they don't have to, they can still marry Gentile women as long as the Gentile women cleave like Ruth did. Right, right, because it won't change that son haplotype. You know what I'm saying? He'll still be, he'll still be, a, you know, Israelite, a descendant of Israel, a descendant of an Israelite man. And, and then there's another question. There's people who were Israelites who were kicked out of the, the camp. Mm -hmm. Does you know it you know I would I would assume that those men who were kicked out of the camps of Israel, they still probably met up with other groups of people hey. and had kids, had sons. So they're still passing down that Y chromosome to all those sons. Right. But spiritually, like you said, um culturally, they would not be uh the congregation, right? Yeah, culturally, they're not a part of the congregation, but genetically, they're still direct descended to Abraham, Isaac right. and Jacob. Right, and I think that's what people need to, you know, start to get an understanding of when we dealing with genetics. There's a difference between, you know, genetics and the spiritual and cultural sense of the Israelite, you know, nation. Um, like, for example, a brother was bringing up the fact that, you know, the Moabites were not allowed into the congregation and how could that, you know, be, or how would that work with haplogroups, groups, you know, and things like that. And how would it be if a man was to have a child with a um, Moabite or Ammonite child, you see what I'm saying? So, and I just had to explain how that'll be genetically, it would still be Israelite, but culturally, maybe it'll be something different, right? 
but that Y chromosome would not change no matter, you know, what's going on within the culture of the people. So let me continue. Go ahead, brother. No, I appreciate you answering those questions. Facts, facts. So the brother says the ancestral home of all Yoruba people is Ileife, House of Iver or Ever. Um, Ever is the original name the Hebrew race called themselves. All right. That's good. That's good. You must be Yoruba, brother. <laughs> Shalom. Shalom. Um says, in your opinion, what sons of Ham you think BM181 and BTM42 go to? Um, I don't know what specifically Sons of Ham they would be. I do believe we found the B2 and Sidon um, in those samples. Let me make sure that's correct. Yep, we found a B2. Yep, a, a BT and Sidon. But like I said earlier, it's hard to identify all these different Sons of Ham. It's hard to identify all these different Sons of Shem. The best thing we can say um, is that we know the Sons of Ham would be this parahaplo group. We know the sons of Shem would be this parahaplo group, and we know that the sons of Japheth would be these or this parahaplo group, and just go from there. Um, you know, looking at different populations and connecting them culturally to those specific descendants, um, based off the history of their traditions and customs. Right. And as facts, they cannot be Levites, specifically those with JP58. Brother says, any tribe that doesn't have DNA matching the Yoruba are not Israelites. Hmm. Is that a fact, brother? Can anyone with E1B1B be Israelites, brother, in your opinion? Brother, tune a hafo lobby or afo lobby. Sorry for butchering your name, brother. About to say something? Second Exodus? Yeah, I wanted to... Uh... I wanted to, you know, and I know a lot of people are saying E1B1A is Israel um, or E1B1B either or, right? But the, the question is, you can't really Hold tell. On, Who keeps putting this bot in this chat? How many times is it going to come back? I don't deleted it like six times. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Bro, you, you might have to get the moderators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, I got they, it. Uh, Probably make me and Isaiah your moderators. Probably. Right. I, I was just saying that. You know, and and as your channel grows, you're going to get more bots. That's <laughs> that's the you know as more the more and more trips bring out it's just that's that's what's going to come from the territory. Yeah, I see. Well, go ahead and finish up your um your statement. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking, you know. You know, it's like when I was using the example of me and my brother. Let's say, let's say my dad is Isaac, and and I'm Jacob, and my brother is Esau. Technically speaking, autosomally and and paternal, you can't tell the difference because Esau married some Ishmaelites, and Esau married some uh, Canaanites, and he married some Egyptians. Right? Well, the Israelites did the same thing. Exactly. You know, Joseph, the son of uh, Jacob, he married what? He married some uh, Egyptian. And then, you know, Moses married a Cushite. And, you know, uh, Judah married, a, uh, I want to think, a Canaanite. But we know that Canaanites uh, got grafted into Israel. So, you know, if the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, they were marrying Arabs, and Egyptians and so autosomally, you can't really tell. You know, a good question would be to try to find out is what group of Canaanites were these Israelites marrying? You get what I mean? What lineage of Canaanites? Was it yeah. the native or was it the introgressives? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, That's those cultural cool. names, I mean, they were just names like the, you know, the Hittites and the Jebusites, those were just names. Those cultures right. literally as they go right. under a different name, under transliteration. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, 
I mean, they could make these people could have mixed and absorbed, and been absorbed into other groups of people, and you know, maybe they're no longer Jebusites anymore. Maybe they're maybe they're calling themselves Edoma and I. Now, right. this is, so there's really no way to tell who's an Israelite just looking at genetic. We can say that hey, these people are submitted as they carry the Tufi and paternal groups. But right, right. That's why I always say. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, bro. No, I was just got to say, man, that's why I always say um, DNA or scripture, DNA, history, um, or traditions, you know, archaeology. You know, that's what all you, you know, can prove who's who or who's an Israelite per se. Uh, we can't just get DNA and say, you know, these people uh, are Israelites unless we get a, you know, pick up a body. Um, of an Israelite and it's a specific clade or it's a specific haplotype, then we can start, you know, making those those type of assumptions or those type of statements, you know. But again, we have to be able to show show that someone is Israelite from you know all angles, all fields, basically. Yeah, exactly. Oh, brother Will. Yes. Uh, when you was bringing about um, Isaiah 18, I think that was talking about the judgment of Ethiopia. Right, right, right. So that right. verse, right. So what I'm about to say real quick is, yeah, so I was bringing that out to um, show that he was making reference to those tall and smooth people um, that will connect to the Dinka and the Shaluk people of the kingdom of Kush or Ethiopia. Right. So just showing that those people, basically showing that Isaiah knew of those tall and smooth people that we see today. Yes. And, and, you, know, and you know, in the King James, it doesn't have tall and smooth. It has something else. What it got? I think it's, I have to go read it in my Bible. I, I'm going to get my Bible right quick. Tall and pill. Yeah, tall and pill. Yeah, that that uh, pill all pill means is uh, divided or or uh, or separated. <laughs> it is a lot of tall and separated tribes down there. <laughs> do so, any yeah. you do any of you still go by the King James Bible or you go by the Hebrew Bible? Me I personally, go ahead. Um, me personally, I like to use the Septuagint and and the Masoretic text together. Because there's some things the Septuagint gets right, and there's some things the uh, Masoretic text gets right, which would be the key. Well, me and personally... The, for the New Testament, I use the... Uh, the, the, the Aram. Well, me personally, I still go by the King James, and I also read the Apocrypha. Let me read this question real quick. Uh, so Jacob Israel says, in the first exodus, the Hebrews left with a mixed multitude. Do you think that it represents or that is present today with Hebrews versus Hotep's conscious community? Hmm. I don't really get the question, honestly. In the first exodus, the Hebrews left with a mixed multitude. Do you think that it presents today with the Hebrews versus the hotel conscious community. Um, no, I guess I can just say I just see two different communities within one larger community that just disagree on, you know, ideologies. Um, about who they are, but the mass majorities of African Americans have nothing to do with Egypt or ancient Egyptians. Well, that's, exactly. that's, not, that's not that's not true to a fact. I mean, um, we do have Ramses the Third, and we do have E one B one A in Egypt to this day. But as far as being the ancient um, rulers of that civilization, the ancient inhabitants, the first inhabitants, the builders, no, nah, I wouldn't say that. Um, the Israelites did build, build Pitom and Ramses, if you want to go back that far, but. 
Um, as far as being Egyptians, no. And that's why I don't like the fact of some black people wearing these unks because Egypt is not our people. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. And as facts, many Hispanics and Native Americans are claiming that they are not Israelites, right? They do know their heritage. Speaking of that, speaking exactly. of that they definitely do know their heritage. Um, they definitely know their heritage. Speaking of that. I know uh, the Israelites were black. I know that for a fact. But when you get your chart saying that I'm Issachar, I don't believe that. Why not? <laughs> Who gave you that chart? Hold on, hold on, fam. Who gave you that chart? Let me say something real quick. Hold on, hold on. Who gave you that chart? Hold on, hold on. I'm going to answer that. But I already I'm asked you a question. I said I don't believe listen, in it. All right, that's what you said. And you're not wanting to tell me who gave you that chart. The most high gave us the chart that was in Genesis 49. That chart is finished, man. So I want to say something about it. Go ahead. Only Afro Mexicans who are in Mexico are Israelites, and only Afro Puerto Ricans are Israelites. I need to throw that caveat out there now because since we deal with DNA now, you do have Mexicans, you do have Latinos. They don't look like the Afro population that are, <laughs> you know, EM2 or E1B1A or that do descend from slaves. Exactly. The transatlantic slave trade history added again. Exactly. Exactly. So, family, if you all have any questions, comments on anything, please feel free to go ahead, throw it in. We just chilling right now. Um, Today, I will begin on part two or the next part of the, I guess you could say, docu-series or edited video. Let's just say that edited video. Um, I'll be dealing with the Western Sahel. I'm going to try to do it country by country, um, like Ghana, Nigeria, doing, dealing with the history of the Jews in those countries when they got there, the tribes, the oral tradition, the customs and things like that. But the next video I will, I'll be doing, I'll be trying to deal with, um, I guess you could say, places like Mauritania, the ancient Ghana, ancient Mali, and Senegambia, the tribes that made up the Jewish history in that area. So that should be that should be real good. Um, a lot of the information from that area is in French. Um, it, like if you watch part one of the video I did. Um, in the beginning, I was talking about, you know, Western Africa and those Jews and specifically the history of Eldad. All that was written in French. Um, so hopefully, well, this time I don't have to do much French sources. So it'd be better if you all understand what I'm saying. So just be looking out for that. Um, bringing out the true history of the people known as Bani, or Bani Israel. All right. Bani Israel of Ghana, Timbuktu. Bringing out that true history. All right. And I want to add something. And please encourage our brothers and sisters to read from Babylon to Timbuktu. That is a good that is a good book. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Kenny Love says the focus shouldn't be Israel. We spent a lot of years on this topic. We know who's Israel. My focus on who's the white man, where he come from, how did he get his skin type? come about. So the white man can be anybody. The white man can be a descendant of Ham. The white man can be a descendant of Shem. The white man can be a descendant of Japheth. I just showed early in the presentation how Coptic Egyptians, who are white-skinned, have, have descendants of Ham amongst them by way of BM60, right? We have Jews in Europe 
who are E1B1A, the same haplotype as the Yoruba, the same haplotype as um, your Igbo. You have a family in Texas of white European-looking people who are all the way E1B1A, right, related to descendants of the slave trade in America. So it's not about the skin color, brother. It's not about the phenotype. Like, not at all. Uh, you can be white and be a descendant of Shem. Like, that's the beauty of DNA, right? So, but if you want to know when skin color came into being, um, then just look it up. Um, I don't know specifically, but that's something you should be able to research on your own. I'm pretty sure if I was to research it, I'd be able to find it. I do know it is a gene variant that came around about 7,000 years ago. So prior to 7,000 years ago, there was no white skin. Um, but the, yeah, people that have, the people that have white skin do descend from, you know, everyone else. They are not Neanderthals or nothing like that. Go ahead, brother. I want to tell Kenny Love that he can, um, modern Europeans uh, are a mixture of four major groups of uh, migrations into uh, into Europe. And and their uh, white skin comes from two genes that uh, that are mutations for depigmentation. Mm -hmm. So those those two genes depigmentation is what caused their skin to get whiter and whiter. Mm -hmm. It's not the same gene in Asia. They have a different gene that codes for depigmentation. And they also found the depigmentation gene in uh, in many African groups, like in Ethiopia. Especially that, in the Khoisan of South Africa, who has haplogroup A, nothing to do with Europeans. They all, like, thank you, brother, for bringing it up. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So so it's, it's simply, uh, you have to look at it as a mix between uh, natural selection and sexual selection. And so when people who may find lighter skin desirable, it might also serve a, um, a biological purpose also. Lighter skin allows people to uh, produce vitamin B, something with little time, in like three minutes or less. People with darker skin can stay out in the sunlight longer, but they produce less, less vitamin B. Yeah, that's like me. I'm brown skinned, but when I get out in that sun, I get kind of dark. Right, exactly. And brother Kenny Love, can you expound on what you mean by that's not true, bro? On um, what specifically isn't true? But um, again, brother, um, like the brother broke it down pretty good, man. In modern day Europeans descend from four different mod uh, migrations. Um. Like he said, and again, like I said, you can't always, you know, just phenotype. You know, not all white people descend from Jaffet. And even before white people, the descendants of Jaffet was black. So um, the brother Yashan or Rashan Washington asked, have you guys found any skeletons or M2 skeletons in Egypt? And the answer is yes. Um, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. And it's also living descendants of EM2 in Egypt today. So can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So this right here is coming from ancient Egyptian genome from Northern Egypt, further discussion. And of course it's Ramses the third, let's see. Right here. So it says the authors completed this, uh, submits the results of PCM methods used on AE remains as a Habach at all states. PCR based methods used were used successfully on mummified Egyptian cats and crocodiles without creating excessive debate. Results that are likely reliable are from studies that analyze short tandem repeats from a mono royal mummies and of Ramses the third. 
So Ramsey's the third had Y chromosome haplogroup E1B1A and old African lineage. All right, and for those who have 23andMe, and for those who have E1B1A and 23andMe, if you have E1B1A, it'll say that Ramsey III is your ancient or you share a paternal ancestry with Ramsey III. Um, and it says he lived in Northeast Africa or Western Asia. All right. Northeast Africa or Western Asia. So, yes, there is a E1B1A mommy. I think it is another one as well. I think he called the E-Man. Let me see if I can find that. Out. That's actually two. It should be another one. His That's what my robot said. Right. Western Asia or Northeast Africa? Um, I think Northeast Africa. Right. But there's two mummies that's been found in uh, Egypt. Ramses the third and the unidentified male known as E-Man. Brother. That's facts. That's facts. Many camps are 5133. C3, it must be interrogated according to the government's standards. That's fact. So they can't turn away Mexicans. They can't turn away Latinos. Um, they get sued, right? They don't want that going on. Um, plus, a lot of them get funded by the government. See, they don't want to talk about uh, Negro, Hispanic, and Mexican. They don't want to talk about them. Yeah, they don't bring much light on the Afro Mexicans. Brother says, Where can I um research my Apple groups regarding the peoples with them? Um, you are EU one or EU 290. All right, so let me see if I can pull up something. I know Wafu is a great site for you to use. And it shows where your specific haplotype is today, what populations have it. All right, let me see if I pull it up. You said your EU290. All right, all right, all right. One second while I pull this up. But again, y4.com is a great site for you to use for this specific search. So I'm about to pull it up now and share my screen and show you what it looks like. Oh my gosh, why are we coming in here with this? Africans do have Neanderthal DNA. Africans do have Neanderthal. Yoruba, have, I'm not even going to say too much. I don't feel like getting into all this information. But Africans do have Neanderthal DNA. That's not true. Especially the people with haplogroup E. These people are Eurasians. They would have been mixing with those same people out, outside of Africa. The people with E back migrated and gave it to the hunter-gatherer populations. Come on, family. You got you to gotta research these things before you start saying stuff. And the brother keep asking me about, you know, the white skin pigmentation. I'll have to do the research and come back to you. But again, I do know from the things I've already said, it's true that it did start with a gene, um, SL gene, and it is seen not only in European populations, but also African populations. So that gene can express in African populations as well. And like the brother said as well, the brother second exodus is also occurs with natural selection. Now we're dealing with the brother about the EU290. Here is Y4.com. Um, just search Y4 EU290, right? And we can see that it is in men of Yoruba, the Mendy of Sierra Leone, Mendy of Sierra Leone. Of course, it's in Americas, such as Barbados, the United States. This is by way of the, um, their descendants making their way there. Um, of course, we're going to find it in Saudi Arabia as well, and even Yemen, Bahiria or Bahiria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia again, Kuwait, Arabia. This is like, I believe further east. This is like East Southern Arabia. Qatar is Eastern Southern Arabia as well, United Arab Emirates. So a lot of times, once you look at these e-lineages on Wafu, it's going to connect you to a lot of Arabian locations as well. And even down here, it gets even more. Now, what's interesting is you can do this right here. You can look at the distribution of it. Let me go back up to the top. 
click info. Let's see if it's on here. You can pull up a map and look at the distribution of EU290. And we can actually see that we have 12 samples of it thus far in Arabia, 18 in Nigeria, one in Yemen, Oman. And this is living samples, all right? So these are living people. Kuwait, this is all the way up near Mesopotamia, right? Of course, Kenya, of course, the Congo, of course, South Africa. So you have a you have the typical EM2 hyper type. And of course, the Americas from the slave trade. But there's always going to be an EM2 connection with Saudi Arabia. So one of you all um filibust right quick why try to find some information for this brother since he can't research on his own um he believes i need to research more so i'm gonna first i'm gonna show that neanderthals or africans do have neanderthal um admixture or dna and then i'm gonna try to find some information on the sl gene for white pigmentation Again, I don't deal with pigmentation. Yeah, he's come on come on, on here trying to, you know, ask me about pigmentation. Um, when it, it really doesn't determine your ancestry. Again, you can be white and descend from any son of Ham. You can be white and descend from a Yoruba Nigerian. Um, but go ahead, brother. What'd you to be, to be honest, um, most of you can see ne neanderthal DNA in the Caucasus Mountain. Correct. But it's also in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that's just a, a racist tactic people like to use um, specifically when trying to degrade people with white skin. Um, they even think Neanderthals were white-skinned when they weren't. Well, let me try to find a source for this. Yeah, there's a source that says Neanderthals actually had dark skin. Right. I had I had to post that on Instagram for people as well. You know, um, you know, it's just a lot of claims within this community that's not backed up on facts. Uh, but let me read this one source real quick. And if I really wanted to, I can come back and do a whole presentation on both of these topics. And emphatically show that Africans do have Neanderthal DNA or admixture and um, white skin evolved 7,000 years ago, seven, 8,000 years ago. The first Europeans were black or dark skinned. Thank you. Chair the man was dark skinned and he had haplogroup I and that's not related to Africans. This source right here is coming from science.org. Um, Africans too carry Neanderthal Neanderthal genetic legacy. Ancient Europeans took Neanderthal DNA back to Africa. Now, this is one of the proposed theories that ancient Europeans took it back to Africa. That would be people with like J, haplogroup R, haplogroup T. Now, people with haplogroup E, like your Yoruba and things, they could have brought that back as well because they in turn have Eurasian ancestry. If you have Eurasian ancestry, you definitely have Neanderthal ancestry. It says for 10 years, genetics but geneticists have told the story of how Neanderthals, or at least their DNA sequences, live on today in Europeans, Asians, and their descendants. Not so in Africans. The story goes because modern humans and our extinct cousins interbred only outside of Africa. So this is why a lot of scientists in the beginning said that only European or said specifically that Africans do not have Neanderthal admixture because these people interbred it outside of Africa. But the, what they did not take into account is the back migrations of Eurasian peoples who would have spread this Neanderthal admixture back into Africa. A new study overturns, excuse me, a new study overturns that notion, revealing an unexpectedly large amount of Neanderthal admixture in modern populations across Africa. All right. It suggests much of that DNA came from Europeans migrating back into Africa over the past 20,000 years, all right? 
This can be facts. We know haplogroup group J back migrated. We know haplogroup group R back migrated. We know haplogroup group T is in Africa as well. And again, I just gave a scenario, scenario about it back migrating or coming in with those E lineages as well. It says that gene flow in Neanderthals exists in all modern humans in, inside and outside of Africa. So it exists inside and outside of Africa. It is a novel of elegant findings, says anthropologist Michael Petragala or Jujila of the Max Planck Institute of the Science and Human History. The work reported in this work issue of Cell could also help clear up a mysterious disparity why East Asians appear to have more Neanderthal ancestry than Europeans. As members of Homo sapiens spread from Africa into Eurasia some 70,000 years ago, they met and mingled with Neanderthals. Researchers knew that later back migrations of Europeans, who else, by, who else back migrated besides Europeans into Africa? Bantus, Yorubas, right? Researchers knew that later back migrations of Europeans had introduced a bit of Neanderthal DNA into African populations, but previously work suggested that it was um, just a smidgen. And not even that, the Koi son of South Africa have this same <laughs> admixture as well. Like I can do a whole presentation. In contrast, modern Europeans and East Asians apparently inherited about 2% of their DNA from Neanderthal. So I'm about to get ready to wrap it up. Can um, I ask when... something? Go ahead, brother. I want to ask some talking about this topic. Now, ahead, now um, I'm going to tell you why I disagree with this, but don't give me backlash on this. I disagree with the point you're saying that a lot of people call whites Neanderthals because they're degrading them because they have white skin. But if you look at it, they the ones have been lying to black people like we came from monkeys. But if you look at their DNA, they, them, their DNA goes all the way back to the Caucasus Mountain. Right, brother. Right, brother. And the thing is, they don't teach us that um, well, they do teach that, but it is, a, it is a theory. It's one of the theories. That's that's not a sound theory, and it's actually been rejected here lately. Um, went against in academia. A lot of scholars, a lot of scientists don't deal with the evolutionary theory of humans migrating or humans involved from apes. If that was the case, we should still see humans involving from apes to this day. Um, therefore, you know, it, it's real easy to debunk or disregard his specific theory on evolution, um, specifically humans from apes, right? Again, because again, that's, that's not true. Because again, we will see monkeys migrating, or excuse me, monkeys evolving into humans to this day. But as far as um, white people coming from the Caucasus Mountains, only certain white people come from the Caucasus Mountains. And that would be people specifically with like haplogroup J, right? For example, a lot of those peoples come from the Caucasus Mountains, but not every single you know person with white skin, and not even every person with white skin is a Caucasian, right? If now, now, sense. now, keep in mind, it's a big percentage of white people that do carry the half of Group J. Correct. That's correct. I, you know, you notice on Twenty Three and Me. They they claim I have white relatives. <laughs> That's funny. You could. If it's not. It's not. It's not just saying that for um, any reason. You can have white cousins by way of admixture. Um, right. In any specific specific scenario, you could be actually related to those white people by way of even a haplo group, right? You could have the same haplo group as a white male, or the white counterpart, or it could be somewhere down your family line, your family ad mixed with somebody who's related to them. So now they're coming up on your 23andMe as you're related to them. So all the time on 23andMe, when it's showing your relatives and things like that, it's, it's not always directly paternal from your paternal father, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Oh. So, and even, even real quick, brother, a second exit, then you can grab it. Even um in a black community, like say for instance, a lot of our mothers, you know, a lot of our mothers have fathers or have children with different fathers. In that case, you can have, say, your a mother had three children by three different men. 
those brothers would have three different high blood groups, possibly. All right, let's just say they had three different high blood groups, but they would still be brothers maternally, right? Is exactly. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Now go ahead, Dr. Second Exodus. Yeah, I wanted to say this before I hopped off. I um, thanks for the lesson. I appreciate it. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who uh, believe that uh, white people or people with white skin come from um, Neanderthals because of uh, fallen angels or, you know, so, you know, some other kind of doctrine with Edomites and fallen angel seed. So my question, <laughs> my question for you is uh, two questions. Do angels have blood? And if if they do have blood, what is the... Um, what is the haplo group <laughs> of angel yeah, blood? I'm that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. And that's what I'm saying. If this thing was so, uh, this if this notion was so, we would see it reflected. Um, I don't believe the whole notion of these modern day Europeans being descendants of fallen angels. And um, I guess you can say earthly women. And I say that mainly because they do have haplogroups that can be traced back to a ancestral node that is in turn related to another ancestral node, which is in turn related to another ancestral node. So if that was the case, or if so-called fallen angels, I guess you can say reproduced with earthly women and birthed it white Europeans, we wouldn't see a specific, um, I guess you can say ancestral or a specific ancestral node that they have that in turn goes back to, or in, in turn is related to D. So they wouldn't have CF that um relates to D. Because again, we know that D and C, CF actually split from each other. Exactly. Hey, bro. Yes. Why, why are these love chats still in your comment section? <laughs> Yeah, bro. I don't. I keep. I can't watch it all the time. I keep doing it, bro. I keep doing it. They keep popping up. It's cool. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna get some eyes set up. We gonna set something up for next show, so we can get them out of here. I don't know why they keep doing it. But can you love? Click the link, brother, before I get out of here, so we can have a conversation, and you can share your information. Because again, you you have to explain to me your your premise. Grace and peace, you all. Shalom, brother. Thank you for tuning in. Absolutely. Shalom, brother. Shalom, brother. Much love. Yep. So the brother says, no one's talking about Neanderthals. We're simply asking about or asking how did that gene mutate again, specifically me. I am not that privy. I am not that scholar on a specific topic of, um, you know, um, excuse me, I was looking at something, but I'm not privy on the topic of the mutation or when these mutations happened for this specific white gene. But I did tell you, I did tell you that I do know that it did happen seven to eight thousand years ago. Um, it's not that hard to look up this information. Um, I know it is called an SL gene. You can look up how it mutates. You can read the genetic information on how it mutates. You can get an understanding of this. I don't believe you need me to answer this. Um, you just don't want to do the work yourself. Um, yeah. But like I say, um, if I need to, I can come back and do a whole presentation on this if you need to understand how white people got white skin. Um, I gave you a few hints. I told you that this lack of skin or this skin mutation or this pale skin mutation started with haplogroup J. It spread throughout Europe. It spread throughout Asia, lightening the rest of these populations, brother. So if anyone has any questions before we get ready and wrap it up, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, feel free to come up, ask a question if you have any. And if not, man, we're going to continue to bring out this information as the time goes on. Uh, it's more likely that white people are Japanese due to their hyper groups. Yeah, they are. They are. That's what I'm saying. Um, Majority of the white people in the world would be descendants of um, Jaffet. So 
I'm trying to see if I can find something real quick to go into this. Um, for this brother, since he feel like he can't, you know, research himself, it's, it's not that hard. Um, see if I can find some form. See if I can find a quick article and then a quick journal or genetic study going over it. And then we're going to wrap it up on the origin of skin color. If not, brother, you, you're going to have to do it yourself, man, because it's not even what this show is about. I don't even talk about skin color over here because it, it really don't matter. Um, like I say, you you can be white and, and not even be related to quote unquote white people. Let's see. Got a brother just joined. Shalom, brother. Shalom, brother. Um, brother, thankful messenger of Yah. Shalom, shalom, Aki, son of Yah. What's up, bro? Shalom, shalom bro. What's going on? Shalom, shalom, Isaiah. How's right, it going, brother? It's going good. I, I, I t unfortunately, I tuned in at the end of uh, at the end, but I always try to uh, catch you. Um. I forgot where we met. I don't, I don't know if it was on uh, Clubhouse. Or... Yep. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, man. What's up, bro? What's going That's on, what's up. I'm glad to see you out here doing this um, DNA uh, anthropology uh, thing now, you know? Oh, yeah. Got to bring it out. Got to bring it out to, you know, complement all the rest of the um, information we've been bringing out over the years. Exactly, Colin. I've been seeing what you've been doing on um, IG and on YouTube, I'm trying to follow along as much as I can. But I'm definitely down to, um, I'm excited about it. And I've been learning a lot too um, from other brothers in the, in the truth that are trying to bring this, um, bring this uh, part of the truth out when it comes to our ancient DNA and our connections to the Levant and Africa as a whole and all other parts of the world too. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm, it, yeah, it's not just Africa, you know. Not all black people are from Africa. <laughs> you know? Definitely not. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. Uh, say it again, Aki. Oh, I'm just saying, man, I appreciate that. Of course, of course, man. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, learning with you guys more. Oh, and let me funny. add. And let me add something. Not all black people are indigenous to America, also. Exactly. Yes, that's true as well. Gone, gone. That's true. Uh, there's this notion that it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, clashing, clashing uh, concepts out there right now where black people are indigenous to. But I, I feel like it's really just at the end of the day, we indigenous to the to the whole earth. You know that, and that's mm -hmm. kind of the whole point. I was just about to say the same thing that we indigenous. Well, we not indigenous, but black people are indigenous, you know, yeah. to the whole world. You know, like I'm yeah. trying to get the brother in the chat to understand, you know, all black people are not related. Um, all mm -hmm. white people are not related. So mm -hmm. exactly. That's true. Mm -hmm. You even got black people in New Zealand. Yep. New Zealand, Ireland, all, all these so-called European places where the, you would think there's most white people or it's only white people or only have ever been white people. Mm -hmm. There were actually a lot of indigenous, quote unquote, black or melanated peoples um, that were that are indigenous to those lands, you know, or at least have been in those lands for centuries before even what we would have thought Europeans would look like today or uh, so-called white people would look like today. Right. And two, and two. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm gonna bring this information out for this brother in the chat. I told him I'm gonna try to find some form, um, since he can't find it. But go ahead, Isaiah. Yeah, not only uh Ireland, but also uh the American Samoa and Hawaii. Exactly, all of Oceania. You know, that's why these camp brothers like to say these, you know, these people are Israelites because they playing skin doctrine, but you, you can't do that. You know, so um, I forgot the brother name. Let me come back and look at the brother name in the chat. Brother Kenny Love. Brother Kenny Love. Here goes some information for you. Um, so let me read this real quick. And the brothers is kind of confused on the origins of white skin. So he says um, an ancient European hunter gatherer man had dark skin and blue eyes. A new genetic analysis has revealed. All right. 
The analysis of the man who lived in modern day Spain only about 7,000 years ago shows light skinned genes in Europeans evolved much more recently than previously thought. The, or the findings which were detailed today in the journal Nature also hint that light skin evolved not just to the lower light conditions in Europe compared with Africa, but instead to the new diet that emerged after the agricultural revolution, said study co-author Charles Luke. Lueva Fox, a paleogenomic researcher at Pompeii Fabra University in Spain. So let's see what else we can get into down here. So it says many scientists have believed that lighter skin gradation arose in Europeans starting around 40,000 years ago, soon after people left tropical Africa for Europe higher latitudes. The hunter gatherers dark skin pushed this, this date forward to only 7,000 years ago, brother. So again, like I said earlier, this this light skin pigmentation wouldn't have come around to around 7,000 years ago. But those light skinned Europeans would in turn still descend from these dark skinned Europeans, brother. They aren't any, they aren't any one different. Um, they aren't Nephilim. And they aren't descendants of fallen angels, right? They're descended from these dark skinned Europeans. It says suggesting that at least some humans lived considerably longer than thought in Europe before losing their dark or the dark pigmentation that evolved under Africa's sun. Um, it was an, it was assumed that the lighter skin was something needed in high latitudes, brother. So that's what a lot of people always assume that lighter skin is needed in in higher latitudes to synthesize vitamin D in places where UV light is lower than its tropics. All right. It says scientists have assumed that, but this was true because people needed vitamin D for healthier bones and can synthesize it in the skin with energy from the sun's UV rays. But darker skin, like that of hunter gatherer or hunter gatherers, man, prevents UV ray absorption. But the new discovery shows that latitude alone did dry or didn't drive the evolution of European skin. All right, European light skin. If it had light or if it had light skin, would have been become widespread in Europeans millennials earlier. All right. So again, if it was if latitude was the reason for the changing of European skin into I guess you could say white pigmentation, it would have happened millennials ago. But because that's not the case, you know, this this skin color didn't come around to around seven thousand years ago, brother. Once more. And again, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's more up-to-date studies we can find or I can find on this um, to expound on this even more. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's even papers that's given associated haplotypes with this specific gene. But again, this is from 2014. Here's the source for you, brother. So I'm back out of that. All right. So does anyone have anything to add or anything before we get ready to wrap this up? Con, con. Yeah, I thought, uh, you know, I thought I, I, I was confused a little bit, too, um, at one point in my walk uh, recently, not too recently, but before I started studying anthropology uh, with a few of you brothers, I was confused about the allele for white skin or the allele for light skin. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a difference between having lighter skin and having a totally different type of phenotype. Um you know, but phenotype doesn't determine your genotype. So right. we can't just look at somebody and say, oh, because they're light skin or because they're supposedly white, that means that um, they're completely different than us or they can't even be related to us genetically. But if you do subscribe to the Bible, you know that everybody has to go back uh, genetically at some point uh, to Noah. Um exactly. But what the brother was talking about with the Nephilims and the, um, and I guess he thinks white people come from Nephilims or, or Neanderthals or something like that. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure how that connects. I have some, I, I've, I've, I've heard about it before, but I think when it comes down to this and when it comes out to light skin, we can't just blame it on some kind of like, you know, otherworldly demonic force or otherworldly force. You know, there are um, some physical things and that can affect people's skin complexion. Um, 
even 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 skin conditions, uh, what do you call it, like leprosy or mm -hmm. things that change the way your skin looks and mutations that occur. So light skin is is essentially a mutation that occurred um, in in ancient Europeans or ancient Caucasians, maybe um, specifically. Do you know the allele for for light skin? Um, the origins of it, brother, and where it goes back to. See, that's what I'm saying. I believe specifically that it starts with haplogroup J. But like I said, I will have to do a whole, I would like to do a whole presentation to explain that. But um, just for now, I do believe that it is with haplogroup J. So like you said, it would have been coming out of the caucuses. Exactly, yeah. I think, I, I don't think it was around for, for super long, like, you know, about 6,000 to 7,000 years. Mm -hmm. that, that specific genetic allele for light skin, which is a mutation that occurred for whatever reason, you know, was it a Nephilim? I don't think so. I don't know. Um, it's possible, but that's something that we have to look into further. Uh, we don't want to just discount anything, but then at the same time, you don't want to sensationalize it either because it, it's, it's like what they did to us. They try to say, oh, we black because of some kind of otherworldly curse, you know? Oh, our brother Kenny said it started with R. Um, That's what I'm said, saying. So if if it started with R, you know, it would have been in Western Europe. Exactly. So it still would have started with, you know, descendants of Japheth. And even before it started with them, they would have been melanated, you know, Europeans. And they would have spread out, start mixing with other people, spreading that gene alone, spreading that mutation alone. It would have got picked up. It, they would have spread it. People would have started getting lightened all around Europe if it did start with R. So I think his I think his specific point was, or the brother Kenny's point was specifically what caused the mutation. Like I told him, I, I don't know that right now. I don't know. That's that's something I have to, you know, dig further into. So he says coming out of Central Asia. Okay. Okay, so brother Kenny, before I wrap it up, just explain me or explain to me your point. All right, so I can get an understanding real quick. Explain to me your point. Yeah, I wish you would just come up and speak about it because then we could actually build on it. Yeah. Yeah, don't be afraid, brother. You know, we all here learning together. Indeed, man. But if you don't want to come up, just feel free to go ahead and, and you know, try to explain, you know, what, what exactly you mean. Um, I might can go back up to the beginning of the chat and see. Um, let's see. Let's see. He says gene mutation, but how? Okay. Oh, uh, thank for a messenger of yeah. Con, con, yes, sir. What's going on? Have you did um a DNA test to find out your haplogroup? group? Yes, I did actually. Um, I've been studying with a couple of the brothers that kind of helped me go towards understanding the anthropology and whatnot. One of the brothers was um. What's his YouTube? Genesis 49ers. Mm -hmm. And one of his companions was a young, a young scholar. He's a really cool dude. His name is um uh the Hebrew of Israel. Um, and but from there they kind of inspired me. Not only them too, before them, there was this other dude. He's not super well versed in DNA, but he brought it up. Uh what's his name? Uh Benea Israel. Benea Israel. Mm -hmm. I think that's his name. I forget his name. Like he did the whole hidden Hebrews thing, but he inspired me to get my DNA test. Um, and from there, I, I did it with 23andMe. I was able to get my paternal and my maternal haplogroup. Um, my paternal is E something, EP2, EP, EP252 or something like that. Yeah, I have to check. Yeah, yeah you, are, you are more likely to be Yoruba because I have yeah, the same thing. I was about to say that too. That's that Yoruba apple type. <laughs> con, con. I, <laughs> yeah, I definitely got that one. I'm going to pull it up real quick just to be specific, but I'm pretty sure when I put it in, I guess I put it in another website uh, to find out my ancient DNA because of the bottleneck effect or the genetic bottleneck effect. Mm -hmm. I put it into one of the websites I learned about. Uh, what is it called? Ancestry, MyTrueAncestry.com. 
when I put it in there, it said that it was E one B one A. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Even though it was E another, I guess subclade of it, it, it yeah. expressed it as E one B one A when I uploaded it. Right. That's um, and it definitely gave me your Ruba. That's interesting that you know that. Yeah. That's basically. Yeah. That's basically what it is. Just like a longer version, or like um, guess you can say your specific mutation or your specific E one B one A clade. Mm. If that makes sense. Uh, what was your maternal side? Oh yeah, uh, my maternal was um, M six, I believe. Yeah, M six. Mm, that's um, interesting. Yeah, my that, that's the second person that told me that actually. Um, oh, it was another brother, huh? Go Sorry. ahead. I'll, I'll try to look at the. I, I I wanted to say that I knew what what population that's associated with, but I'm gonna Google it before I say it. Go ahead. Con con. It was another brother I asked about my maternal. Um, I think I seen him in the chats too. He goes by Lion Farm. Yes. And he's a cool dude. I I try to follow a couple of my brothers that's into this kind of study or this research. Um, just so I could be unbiased, because I know some people, people have different models, but I, I just love to see my brothers and my sisters doing this, you know, because I think it, it really does uh, help our cause and it, and it matters. But um, with M6, from what 23andMe has told me, um, what, what before I even say it, what do you guys think it is? And I, I think I want to confirm I was, it afterwards. I was going to huh? say, I, I know it comes from L3, so I was going to say that's like... North African, East Af like Berber, Ethiopian, Torag, maybe. Um, or if not that, then um, probably like um, European from a European female. <laughs> nah, <laughs> nah. What you think? What you think, brother Isaiah? Do you know anything about M6? No, but I'm guessing it probably came from the Middle East somewhere. Right. Brother Line Form, what you think, Brother Line Form? Throw something in the chat for us. Oh, yeah, Line Form. Yeah, he would. He, I think he would know more, too, uh, like you guys. So let's see. So did it say something specifically for you or no? Did it give you any information on it? Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it told me that it goes back to... um. South, South Asia, South, South Asia, yes, and That's Central Asia. Yeah, I just found it. That's interesting. That's interesting indeed. And you know what it is? Basically, my mom and dad is from Trinidad, Tobago. Mm -hmm. So with Trinidad and Tobago, there was a time when a lot of um, right. go ahead, a lot of um, how do I say this? South Asians or Indians, uh, Indians went into Trinidad as indentured servants. Um, so we have a, uh, my grandmother, she was a, um, a Indian from India, literally. <laughs> like, um, and those people, as far as I know, these are what we would consider to be the Elamites, um, the sons of Shem on, from the Elamite side. So th those are who the, and I guess the indigenous Indians are from in India or East India, I guess I could say it like that. But um, yeah, that's what it told me. It told me M6 goes back to, uh, I think it says Bangladesh and like that area, I guess, or of you know, South Asia. You know, that's that's real crazy because as soon as I saw that, I was like, they did have, a, you know, an integration of Indians or East Asians into the um, Caribbean, um, just like you had, you know, an integration of Arabs into the So that's interesting how, you know, your, your MTDNA you know, reflects actual history. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Caribbean. And brother Kenny Love, real quick, I don't. Can you explain what you're, um, you know, talking about? Uh, he says I understand, or I think understanding this is the key to understanding the world. Understanding what, brother? Um, understanding what specifically? Understanding what? Um. Yes, yes, yes. I do remember seeing the M in the two fiends. So that's interesting as well. So yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. M in the two fiends had M2 as well, I mean. Mm-hmm. 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 
And like I said, it, it does come from L. So Con, L, L3 specifically. L3 specifically. So Con, I'm looking up, I'm looking it up now just to confirm where it comes from. But yeah, I do believe it said it comes from L. M6 is a subclass or mm -hmm. a subclass of a subclass of L. Mm -hmm. Um and as far as you said, the Natufians had M, so that I guess that would kind of verify the um, the Elamite extension, uh, or val val validate it even more that the indigenous Indians or South Asians were Elamites. Uh, if I could say it like that, I guess you can't say everybody, but at least yeah. the ones that come from M six and and a certain haplogroup group um, paternally. Yeah, we have to dig into those lines to, um, you know, get a little more information on that. But indeed, indeed, that is deep indeed. Con, I would love to learn more about M6. If that's if that, if y'all could do something like that, that would be a little super request. <laughs> yeah, fast. We can get some information on that. That ain't no problem. So, um, anybody in the chat um section, anybody in the comment section, anybody has any final questions, any final words, please feel free to um, add or ask, like I said, next week, next Shabbat, I hopefully have something done. We can get into something else. Um, so if not, I'll see you all the Shabbat after that, man. And um, anyone else on the panel have anything to say, feel free. And of course, thank you all for tuning in and interacting with me today. Uh, all praise to the most high, man. Thank you for letting me come up here and, sh and share a little bit. And I'm definitely looking forward to the next time I get to speak with you again, brother. Uh, honestly, I've been looking forward to it and I have been watching you for a while. Um, brother Isaiah, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, shalom to everybody. I love you guys. You know? All right, nice brother. Much you. love. Much love, brother. Nice to meet you too, bro. And uh, while I'm at it, anyone feel free to Come over to Facebook if you have a Facebook. Join this group right here. Um, join this group right here. This is a group me and the brother Neri Yahoo put together on Facebook. My internet is acting crazy. It's called Zephaniah Alliance right here. So feel free. We got 39 members right now. We got, we got some pretty good posts in here. People sharing a lot of info. Got one of the brothers that's in the chat sharing some info on that right now. All right, brother Ruth Smith, some other brothers in here. So feel free to join us, man. We got some good information within this group. Again, it's called Zephaniah Alliance. Um, we just share source material and support on those Israelite tribes, you know, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, like the prophet Zephaniah stated. Um, all right. So again, feel free to join this chat or this group. Um, we will accept it. And please feel free to ask questions in this group, share information. This is just a building group. So, again, we had 39 members so far in a week. Feel free to continue to join. All right. So I'm going to see what's going on in the chat. And then after that, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, here go the source, too, for the M6 as well by the brother. It says the Iron Age dogs from the Ayubayi, Huyik. Eastern and the ah, oh, he dealing with the ah, oh, you you going deep? You dealing with the um other Natufian site? He dealing with the Natufian site in Anatolia, so yeah. So in East Anatolia, PMC, um, April eighteenth, two thousand twenty one, individual dog skeleton underneath from grave M six, M six Iron Age by Anatolian Turkey. All right, so. For those that don't know, the two fiends were stretched from <laughs> Syria, Palestine, or Palestine, all the way up to you know Turkey. So those E lineages stretched from all the way up there. So it's real interesting, including that MT. So again, family, I thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for all um you all on the panel, and again, I will see you all next Shabbat. All right, Shalom. Thank you.